Good morning. Welcome to all of you to this uh, meeting for presenting the results of the Horizon 2020 uh, labyrinth. Uh, I am very, uh, very happy to, uh, to present uh, this, this final result because it has been a very uh, complex project because the, we started just in the beginning of the pandemic. It has not been easy to manage at the beginning particularly. But everybody has uh, collaborated uh, wonderfully in the development of the, of the project. Thank you very much to all of you. Uh, we have started the, uh, the presentation with two, uh, with three speakers. I will be the third. And uh, initially, the first speaker will be Daniel Benito Astudillo, which is the general director of the civil aviation from the Ministry of Transport in Spain. And uh, posteriorly, it will speak Juan Francisco Reyes from Sedeti, and then we will, they will do a, a very uh, brief presentation of the whole project, and then we will go to the technical, more detailed technical part. Then, please, our first speaker, Daniel, when you want. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, it is a pleasure for me to participate in this final event of Project Labyrinth, uh, where there will be presented its developments, uh, use cases, and, and its results, of course. Let me start by thanking you all, participants, for coming here today, the organization of, for considering the DGCA. Uh, you know it is within the Ministry of Transport, Mobility and the Urban Agenda of, of Spain, and as well as the speakers for making this event uh, possible. Uh, for me, in particular, this is a honor and, and I'm very honored to be here. Okay, um, Project SAS Labyrinth, coordinated by the Carlos III University, um, in which the university, important research centers and private companies participate are undoubtedly key for the development of new urban and air mobility concepts of the future. Likewise, they are um, a clear example of what can be achieved when so many brains collaborate and coordinate with a common objective, the development of the technological basis that allow us to build the future. I will begin this brief opening of the event by contextualizing the drone sector with some figures for us for Spain and, and Europe, also pointed out the challenges and opportunities that the deployment of US space will offer us, to which projects such as Labyrinth will undoubtedly contribute. There is no doubt that the global development of the drone industry has configured itself as one of the levers for innovation in the transport sector and sustainable mobility policies. In this sense, Spain has indisputably emerged as one of the European leaders. After the entry into force of the European regulations, there are already more than 71,000 operators registered in Spain and about the same figure of remote pilots. Indeed, the improvements in efficiency and productivity in multiple areas are worth noting. For the year 2030, Forecast within the Drone Strategy 2.0 adopted at the end of 2022 by the European Commission foresee that the economic impact could reach 14,500 million euros and create more than 145,000 jobs. However, the sector continues to confront significant barriers, especially when it comes to highly complex operations, such as those carried out beyond the visual range of the pilots, or operations that take place in urban environments. All these highlights the need for all stakeholders in the sector to advance in the development of technologies, systems, and services, thanks to digitization and automation. Services that, thanks to digitization and automation, allow them to operate with increasingly demanding and sophisticated drones in environments that are also increasingly complex and intended for a growing number of users. And all this always taking into account that the operations are carried out with safety warranties. In this sense, initiatives such as Labyrinth, which has developed a new centralized planning system for the operation of drones, can contribute decisively to the digitization automation process in which the industry finds itself 
allowing all kinds of new real application of drones in populated environments. To achieve this, it is essential to lay the foundations for the mobility of drones, especially in urban areas, guaranteeing a safe environment. And this is where the use space concept comes into play. This concept, your space, which is configured as a safe and efficient ecosystem for the operation and provision of services with drones, is currently one of the priority objectives of the European Commission's transport policy. Thus, Europe's perspectives for 2030 are for drones and for the aforementioned ecosystem to be an accepted and integrated part of the life of citizens. The common goal is to consolidate the sector as a vector to achieve the smart and sustainable mobility of the future, fostering the creation of an innovative market for services and offering new opportunities for economic growth. For this to be possible, our effort must now focus on fostering the development and adoption of the necessary technologies, as well as their public acceptance. It is also important to enhance their accessibility. In this regard, the integration of drones is a huge challenge. Right now, the airspace for drones is practically separated from manned operations. However, in the long term, the goal is to achieve full integration that allows all users to operate freely in the same airspace. The implementation of U-Space emerges, therefore, as the facilitator to initiate this paradigm shift and satisfy this need for integration in the near future. As you know, we have created in Spain the U-Space National Deployment Action Plan, also known as PANDU, at national level which has been established as an essential instrument for the coordinated development of actions focused on the US space system implementation during its initial phase. The plan was promoted by the DGCA with the participation of AESA and ENAIRE with the collaboration of the Ministry of Defense and aims to involve all agents in the sector. On our part, the DGCA will continue to work to align national regulations with the latest European standards and promote the actions of the PANDU, which addresses all the necessary areas for the effective deployment of your space in Spain. Space actions focused on the development of national zoning, decisions on the national models for services provision, certification of new providers, and coordination with regional and local administrations. During the entire process, the DGCA is aware of the importance of involving military authorities in the coordination and decision-making process regarding U.S. space. It is essential to engage the defense sector to ensure the efficient use of airspace during its deployment. So, in the coming years, in addition to our continuous engagement in European and national regulatory development, the industries drive through initiatives like Labyrinth, will enable us to further progress towards full integration of drones. As we move forward, it is crucial for us to address the following question. What lies ahead? In the first place, the next major milestone is the designation of the first Spanish US space airspace. To this end, national stakeholders are thoroughly working on defining criteria and procedures, certifying the first new service providers, and developing risk assessments to ensure the safe implementation of the first US space. Furthermore, we face the challenge of sustainability. The deployment of US space must be economically sustainable while ensuring environmental sustainability. To achieve this, we need to foster social acceptance of drones, enabling citizens to fully recognize their economic and social potential, positioning US space as a facilitator. Moreover, this sector boosts will facilitate the creation of new jobs and business opportunities, further expanding the potential of this industry and maintaining Spanish leadership position at the European level, consolidating our status achieved in recent years. Lastly, we encounter the challenge of deploying the necessary infrastructure to enable advanced and complex drone operations. Infrastructure for drones communication, navigation and surveillance plays a crucial role in this regard. 
it is of utmost relevance to ensure the development and implementation of robust infrastructure to support these operations. In conclusion, we must continue making our best efforts to promote the drone industry and make the future of air mobility a reality. We must all be aware that we still have a lot of work ahead of us, but I am confident that with the support of innovation projects like Labyrinth, we will be able to accomplish it and ensure that Spain remains at a reference in this field. I'd just like to finish reiterating um, once again my gratitude for invi the invitation to participate in this event, which without doubt will help your space and the new air mobility become a reality as soon as possible in our country. Thank you for, for your attention. Okay. Our next speaker is uh, going to be Juan Francisco Reyes, the CDT. Please, Juan Francisco. Good morning. Uh, it's yeah, it's uh, it's a pleasure for me to be to be here today. I would like first of all to congratulate Labyrinth Consortia for the success of the of the project, and of course, I would like to thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, my presentation is not focused on drones or, or EU space. It is focused more on possibilities of uh, financing and the uh, European programs and uh, national funding programs. Now, well, uh, all of you know that the, the previous uh, Horizon, uh, well, the previous framework program was called Horizon 2020. It was divided in, in three pillars, mainly one of them focused on, on excellent science, one of them focused on uh, industrial leadership, and uh, the third one was uh, focused on societal challenges. Uh, this pillar was uh, divided in turn into seven more sub-challenges, one of them called Smart, Green and Integrated Transport, where you could find all the funding for mobility and also for aviation. Uh, in the World Program 2019, there was a, a, a topic focused on innovative application of drones for ensuring uh, safety in transport. And one of the projects funded was uh, Labyrinth, uh, coordinated by uh, Universidad Carlos III, working in a, a new management system for improving the safety and security of drone swarms. We are very, very, very happy to have such as uh, successful entities coordinating this kind of project projects because uh, I think it is the perfect moment to be in the loop of creating these US space based technologies. Now there is a new framework program or relatively new framework program running from uh, 2021 to 2027. It is called Horizon Europe and it has more than 95 billion euros funding, European Union, Union funding. And it is also, di also divided uh, in three pillars. The first one focused again in uh, excellent science. The third one is focused on uh, innovation. This is a, a new approach. And the second one is a mixture of the uh, previous pillar two and pillar three. And it is uh, focused on societal challenges, global challenges, and European industrial uh, leadership. It is divided in clusters, in five clusters. One of them is smart, uh, sorry, climate, energy, and mobility, where you can find all the funding for mobility and also for aviation, nearly all the funding. This cluster is divided also in different destinations. Destination five and destination six are completely focused on mobility. And here we can find the funding for aviation also. Destination five, clean and competitive solution for all transport modes. It's divided in four areas. One of them is aviation. This uh, area is uh, launching uh, aviation topics with low TRL, TRL one, two, three, for maximum, uh, it looks for pre-competitive research and, and technologies for future developments. And they will complement it with topics that will be launched under institutional partnerships, such as clean aviation and CSAR. Of course, all these topics uh, has to be in line with the Green Deal and the objective of uh, net zero uh, emissions in 2050. 
practice, one of the uh, objectives of the European Union. Destination six is safe, resilient transport and smart mobility services for passengers and goods. It is divided in three areas. The third one is safety and resilience per mode and across all transport modes and all topics re related to safety and security for aviation can be found under this area. These are the preliminary results of uh, calls 2021-2022 of cluster 5, destination 5. Uh, as you remember, I, I, I showed you that it was divided in different transport modes. One of them was aviation in the top right of the slide. You can see that Spain is the first country in Europe receiving funding and coordinated uh, projects. So Spanish entities are doing very, very, very well in uh, this Horizon Europe program, uh, specifically in aviation in this part. Beyond these cluster five uh, work programs or goals or topics, there are uh, institutional partnerships. Two of them are uh, focused on aviation. One of them is clean aviation with 1.7 billion euros European Union funding and uh, looking the objective of zero emissions in aeronautics for 2050. It looks for uh, technologies that can be deployed as soon as possible and trying to uh, integrate demonstrators at the end of the pro program that will be around 2030. The second uh, partnership, institutional partnership is CESAR-3. CESAR-3 aims to digitally transform, transform the air traffic management, making Europe's airspace the most uh, secure, efficient and environmentally friendly sky to fly in the world. It has 0.6 billion euros European Union funding plus uh, 0.5 uh, billion euros uh, coming from Eurocontrol that participate in this institutional partnership. Uh, beyond that, there will be other opportunities, more for aeronautics uh, under the uh, Clean Hydrogen Institutional Partnerships and under the uh, Batteries Co-Program Partnership. And now let's move to the uh, national financing. Uh, CTI is a business, public business entity uh, on behalf of the Ministry of Science and Innovation, and, and it is the official national funding agency for research and innovation in Spain for companies. Mm -hmm. um, it mainly addressed this financing, th financing through four activities. The first one is the, the, the support of projects with technical assessment and, of course, a budget. The second one is the coordination or the management of the coordination and the coordination of Spanish participation in international cooperation programs. Uh, in fact, CDI is the official, one of the official entities representing Spain in international committees such as Horizon Europe, CESA, Clean Aviation, European Space Agency, CERN, UMESAT, between others, and Eureka, for example. The second activity, the third activity is the technology transfer with international uh, countries, and the fourth activity is the support and the setting up and consolidation of uh, technological entities. For that, CDI manages uh, several programs, several calls. I'm not going to explain all of them, but only two of them. The most common one is the ED program. It is a, a bottom-up program, no predefined line, not predefined technologies. Um, CTI support the, the Spanish entities up with up to the 85% of the, of, the, of the budget, and in loans in this case. And there is a non-repayable part. That means that it is a, an equivalent grant up to 33% of the budget of the, of the project. In uh, 2021, CTI supported 16 aviation projects uh, with more than 35 million euros. There, is a, there was a new um, program, BTA program, Aeronautical Technology Plan, as the Spanish acronym, thanks to the Next Generation European Union. Um, uh, one of the measures foreseen in our 
our uh, resilience tra transformation and um, recovery plan was to reduce the environmental impact uh, of uh, aeronautics. For that, CDI created this uh, program with grants. And the first call was in 2021, focused mainly on the decarbonization of the aviation sector, but some of the budget went to UAVs and multipurpose aircrafts and systems. The second call included a new challenge, digitalization and smart manufacturing, and it uh, had 80 million euros uh, in grants, expecting to mobilize 160 million euros. The third call closed three days ago, uh, I think, and it had uh, 40 million euros. And let me finish showing this uh, figure or graphic. This is the CTI support to, to the aviation sector uh, from 2010 to 2021 with more than, than 700 million euros. You can see that in 2021, there is a big increase. Uh, this is uh, the reason is the new PTA program that allowed us to triplicate our support to aviation. And that's all from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any question, I'm happy to answer. OK. Uh, now we are going uh, to do a, a very brief presentation of the Labyrinth project. Uh, in the second part, we will uh, in, introduce more, more in more detail each of the technical each of the technical part. But in order to provide a, a global view of the project, I I want to do in this uh, presentation. Well, uh, the objective of the project was to uh, develop a small scale traffic control for unmanned uh, vehicles, drone for unmanned drones, uh, basically uh, concentrated on, on three uh, important, on four important aspects. One of them is uh, how to plan in an, an automatic way in order not to have uh, conflict before flying, in order to manage all of this in an automatic form. The second is how to maintain uh, the complete information of the drones that are flying at every moment. And this is a very uh, important the communication part. And also this, due to this is a service, it's a UTM service in general in the US space. We need to maintain uh, cybersecurity uh, standards in order to, to, to have that. And all of this needs to be integrated with the GCS system and also developing uh, a new uh, Humanit traffic control management. Okay, in this uh, in this sense, uh, the, the project is a full scale, uh, a small unit uh, control traffic unit for operating, in order to improve safety and security in uh, in transport and then in very specific areas, ports, uh, airports, uh, for some emergency situation in some in some places, and also in uh, roads. Okay, and the consortium is strongly uh, oriented to this, uh, this, this, uh, all these problems. On the technological parts in the in the consortium, participate Space, which is an operator with uh, drones mainly for scare building in airports, uh, Telefonica, and also on the scientific part we have uh, four uh, groups, which is uh, DLR from Germany, Inta from Spain, IT from Austria, and Universidad you know, Carlos III of Madrid. Uh, the end users are in this project very important because these uh, these are who have the information of which are the needs of the of the ports of the of the roads and of the emergencies and they have uh, helped a lot in in order to define which kind of mission we can automatize and hold. Uh, apart from that, we have some consultative partners like Pons and Income particularly on the regulation part, that all the normative aspects of which things need to be improved or are not enough. And also another implementation in our partners like DIN or Eurocontrol that is help us to, 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 to uh, try to uh, give uh, more knowledge on how should be the, the, uh, the standards, in, which is the, the, the time, the separation time between drones and so on. In, in global, we have 13 partners from five countries, Spain, Germany, Austria, Belgium, and Italy. This is the, 
the web of the labyrinth project. Okay, then as I have uh, explained it, the, the objective is to let uh, have a control traffic management as automatized as possible in a small scale area in such a way that only one operator can manage a, a fleet of drones that are operating all the safety aspects in, in this small control area. In this case, we have uh, considered up to up to 10 drones, but in, in simulation, we have tested that there much more, 30 and more. But the, the idea is that only one operator can manage all, all the system in this small scale area. They can give the mission, the mission is automatically planned, they conflict with the other and verify that the, sub, the, the path is being properly executed. The idea is to validate that in the different uh, scenarios, uh, seaport, uh, traffic transport, uh, airports, and also for emergency situations. And also the, the idea is to, to progress, uh, to accelerate the regulatory adaptation in Europe for, for, and the public system to, have, uh, to develop the industry of the drones and also to propose new business. Okay. Uh, from a uh, the structure of the whole consortium, you, we have a different uh, aspect. The path planning basically has been uh, worked with by the Universidad Carlos III de Madrid uh, and DLR. The communication has been done by Telefónica and uh, Universidad Carlos III de Madrid, the communication groups. Cybersecurity has been done by uh, IT from uh, Austria. All of these technological parts are integrated in the US space and the GCS that has been developed by DLR, INTA, and SPACE. And also the other partners has uh, worked on the uh, definition of the different piloting modes and so on, which are the typical mission we can need to do. The regulatory aspect also has been very important to understand which is the need from the regulation point and, and also from the standardization point. And also, uh, INCOM has uh, helped in the management of the whole project. Well, the, the scenarios we have are mainly four because we this is a call that is uh, oriented to, to safety for in transport, safety and security in transport. Uh, we have considered different potential missions uh, that a typical uh, operator in this kind of uh, situations do. For instance, in the road transport, we have speed control, vehicle distance measurements, uh, plate identification, vehicle tracking, traffic uh, counting, traffic monitoring, and so on. For the waterborne transport, we have vessel inspection, dredging in the port, uh, Observing in the, infra uh, the infrastructure of the seaport, how is the, the, the different elements on, on the port. In night transport, we have build the scaring, uh, pavement inspection in the in the takeoff in the in the takeoff uh, pista, uh, surveillance of the of the fence, whatever. And in the emergency, we have uh, communication and surveillance of the different operation. All these uh, scenarios has been considered in order uh, to define which are the typical uh, missions from the planning point of view that can be uh, done and managed by this small uh, traffic control for, for drones. Okay, we have some preliminary consideration because uh, we need to consider that the, the maximum sailing we are permitted to fly is uh, around uh, 500 meters, uh, 150 meters more, more or less over, over the floor level. It, this change, uh, or, or when we started the project change from one country to another, in one country was one, 135, another is a little more. The second question is the spatial resolution. Uh, we are uh, automatically doing the path planning. That means we need information of the, of the, of the environment. In this case, we have uh, used public information, in this case, the Instituto Geográfico Nacional in Spain. And in the case of, uh, for instance, in La Especia, we have information from, from a company that uh, has some limited uh, resolution. In the case of Spain, the, the information provided by, by the Instituto Geográfico Nacional is five by five meters each sale. And in case of Italy, it was a little better because it was one meter. One meter is... Uh, too much for managed properly. And then we have uh, managed uh, around five by five meters because from an operational point of view for an area of three by three kilometers, which is what we consider it in this small scale uh, traffic control is enough. 
the the UA, the, the, the drones density we we, we initially considered for uh, managing the security and safety in, in this uh, in this uh, transport scenario, we have limited to ten drones. Okay, but uh, we have made simulation up to much more than that. Okay, obviously if the area is very small, if you increase too much, the number of vehicles is, uh, start to uh, to saturate, and then uh, there are no uh, feasible uh, path and so on. We have uh, different questions. And on the operational capability, uh, we have made a, a very strong use of uh, 5G technology in communication because we need to uh, know which is the, the position of each drone continuously to know exactly in which point of the path is, uh, is the drone, is the drone is out of the path in time or in a space, and in that case we need to, to replan because it's a contingency for us, and the, the system needs to be prepared for doing, for doing that. Uh, some preliminary aspect is the, the project is strongly oriented to, to path planning. Then some aspect we, we, we assume, for instance, that each drone has an autopilot and some, some basic uh, takeoff and landing capabilities. Uh, by now, we, uh, we assume that the all UAVs has a direct radio frequency link with the GCS by safety reasons, because we cannot uh, let otherwise. Then we have the two possibilities, but communication with the drone by 5G or also by a radio frequency link. And also the task and mission is, deci is decided by, an, by the supervisor, an operator for the, for the full area. This is the person who validates everything that is uh, automated, but with a uh, human supervision. And then the technical uh, objectives of the project has concentrated very strongly on the how to coordinate and the conflict all the parts of all the, the, the drones continuously, because we start, we're assuming that the, all the, the missions are ordered almost online. This is, I need that, in that moment, you need to plan uh, this mission now, because uh, let, me, let me know when we can do that. The second aspect is how to manage the whole system to supervise the, this uh, execution of this path that are doing the, all the drones in order to detect problems, contingencies, and if needed, to modify uh, the plans according in order to have uh, safety in the whole system. This requires a continuous and safe communication between the different elements, UAV, GCS, and, uh, and the UTM. And the idea is to use any possible uh, communication means. We have thought in initially in 5G, but also in satellite, because in port there are no 5G when you move a little kilometers aside. And also the possibility of using uh, Wi-Fi between, particularly between, between drones. And also to maintain the cyber security of the whole system, because these are UTM services that are on the net, many of them. Okay. Uh, we have not concentrated on the sensorial part. Yeah? The sensorial part, the payload of the drone, is more concerned for a very specific uh, piloting uh, activity. We are concentrated on the on the traffic system. Okay, the, the use case analysis has been very detailed. Uh, all the users have provided us a lot of information about which are the requirements of each of the pilot emissions they need in order we can define uh, what we uh, need to do at, at the planner level. Uh, an interesting aspect is that we have considered very different operational areas. Some of them as complicated as the center of Madrid. We have to do a lot of test uh, planning in areas as uh, complex as uh, this is Azca, Bernabeu, uh, Torres de Quillo. We, we have buildings of uh, 150 meters and then the drones need to, uh, to avoid of them. All these buildings act as a constraint to the, to the planning problem. And this is a very uh, challenging uh, environment for doing that. We have also considered uh, situations like port, uh, like, like this in La Spezia, which is a very uh, special uh, situation because we have very big elements like, like cranes that are not static. Cranes can move uh, in some areas, but can move, and then you need to geofence some special areas because probably in that area you need you need to uh, take care because the, these big cranes are moving. Okay, and also we have the considered also more uh, typical environment like uh, Rosas Airport, which is more similar to a typical transport situations or, or, or airport. 
This is an, 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 an example of what the path planning uh, do on the, on the left. You can, you can see here, this, this is a, an, an area coverage. In this case, this is a drone that is doing uh, an observation of the, of the sea, looking for something or trying to expect something. Uh, on the, the others, just in the middle, are uh, paths for growing from one point to another point. At the middle of execution, red points are the executed part. The blue one is the part that is not executed. And on the right, we have this is defined by the operator because of, you, you see that the points are a little more irregular because this has been marked by the operator because he wants to look at these areas uh, concretely. Then the idea is to coordinate all of this mission, coordinate all of these parts in order there are no no conflict. Okay, then uh, we have different mission, different strategies, and different planner for do, for doing that. On the communication architecture, uh, have done a, a lot of work. This uh, this architecture support multi interface UAV, satellite, cellular, LOS, Wi-Fi, and so on. Multi hop network establishment between UAV, 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 GCS, and also with the uh, UTM. And this has been evaluated and, and in simulator and also in, in, in real test. This will be explained by the group of communication that can explain it better than me. And on the cybersecurity part, uh, also this system is, uh, is on the net, part of them. Uh, the UTM is a service on the net. The planner is located in Madrid. Uh, the UTM uh, is, is located in, in Germany. And uh, the GCS is in the in the operational area. Then we need to maintain cybersecurity, and then there are work on cryptographic mechanisms in order to achieve privacy protection, to detect different uh, UAV anomalies, uh, aggregating different information, and also very strong analysis, which are the potential threat that we have in this uh, in the whole system. And this has been used with the uh, threat modeling tools that has uh, the IET. In, in his lab. On the US space and the GCS, uh, the US space uh, manage the supervision of the of the traffic and also the definition of the offense and so on. And uh, ask the planner which are I need a plan for doing that or for that missions and then recover the mission and then send to the GCS in order to authorize and uh, execute. Then, uh, apart from the developing of the US page, they have developed uh, a web app in, in order the, the user on the GCIs can easily uh, define a flight plan to create it, to approve it, and receive the warnings and the traffic information at this moment, display the drone status and the traffic uh, position, and receive at the all the UTM's instruction. This is um, some uh, glance of the, of, the, of the whole system. And this has been finally tested on the real scenarios with different set of drones. In particular, uh, case of the Shepard, which we have doing a test with six drones, two of them physical, um, four of them uh, with electronics simulated, but uh, electronic uh, with uh, real uh, GCS and so on. And in case of uh, the DJI multi-rotor from INTA and also in, in La Spezia Port, we have made different tests, in, for instance, in La Rosas for different kind of mission with uh, different uh, typical drones. There are differences because this drone cannot uh, stop, obviously, because it's a fixed wind drone and has a particular requirement from a plane point of view because it cannot uh, obviously stop. And the, the, the requirements from the multi-rotor are slightly, slightly different. Okay, well, thank you for, for your interest, uh, and we will uh, have a coffee, and we can work a little more. Uh, and after that, we will do a more detailed explanation of, of the, different, the different working package with more detail on the technical aspect, if you are interested in it. Thank you. Let's continue with the uh, with the presentation of the result of the of the labyrinth project. In this uh, second part, we are going to present uh, the results of the different uh, work package. Uh, in before lunch, uh, we'll present the uh, the path planning part, the communication part, the cyber security uh, results, and also uh, the GCS and US space results. We will have then lunch and then in the afternoon the case studies and policies and standardization.
Okay, let's start with the uh, with the path planning uh, results. I'm going to to present it. Okay, from the path planning path. Well, the team that we have worked in the project mainly which has been groups uh, of the University of Carlos III on the, with DLR and X space different person that has been participated in this uh, in this work package. Uh, initially, we uh, we started uh, analyzing very carefully which were uh, the, the typical transport piloting uh, operation that the user uh, demands of a system uh, like this. Uh, these uh, these uh, different piloting cases are apparently different because one is oriented to tra water transport uh, system, or there's a, a road transport system, or air transport, or uh, seas and rescue. All, all this mission seems uh, very, very different from the sensorial point of view because we have different, 14 different pilot emissions, but from the uh, point of view of the path planning, there are uh, not uh, so many missions. And then uh, after analyzing this piloting uh, typical uh, activities, uh, we, we reached the conclusion that with three main uh, path planning um, uh, missions, we have enough to cover all of them. From the path planning point of view, obviously, uh, it requires different sensors and different uh, questions. And these missions, these basic missions, we have considered are point-to-point -point motion in the, in the drone, uh, linear coverage. In this case, the idea is that uh, the operator defines a set of points uh, joined by, uh, by, uh, by lines and to cover this sequence of points. And in, uh, the, other, the third one is the area coverage. The idea is uh, I want to uh, inspect or supervise uh, a given area because we are doing dredging or we are inspecting the, uh, the floor or whatever. And these are the three uh, main missions we are considering at the path planning uh, point of view. This is an example of the three different missions. Uh, this mission can be combined because, for instance, if you are doing an area coverage, you need to go to the start of the area coverage. You need to do the area coverage and then to uh, go to another point or to finish or or uh, link with another mission. Uh, in this case, in the in this uh, right upper part, we have a typical point-to-point -point mission, which is uh, planning the motion of the drone from one initial position to one end position. In this case, we have a typical uh, linear coverage. In this case, we have a set of points defined by the operator, and the drone need to go from this uh, point to start and then to uh, uh, cover all the area that is marked by the by this sequence of points. And the area coverage is typically for, in, in this case, for containers or any other like that, that you need to uh, go back and forth in order to uh, cover specifically all this all this area. Well, when we are uh, going to uh, to do the path planning, we have uh, four different aspects. The first one is uh, which are the the constraints we need to uh, to consider at the at the path planning point. In this case, we have for one part the operational area, in this case, the operational area map, consider that many uh, buildings, for instance, in, in cities are very tall. We are speaking of more than 100 meters in, in, in the center of Madrid. And this act as a constraint, as a serious, as a, as a, as a head of fence. Uh, on the other side, we need to consider uh, which are uh, the, the paths of uh, the drone that are currently flying because they are going to move in our environment and they are going to pass through the different point and this act as a dynamical constraint at the time of planning. On the other side, we have another different constraints like, uh, for instance, a geofence. We need uh, to define a geofence in the cranes area or uh, over the Real Madrid Stadium or whatever. And also, we, we have included the possibility of defining uh, risky areas, risky areas in terms of uh, risk for uh, for persons. Okay? For instance, try not to fly over this area because probably there are many people. So, okay, these are the the three main constraints we consider at a path planning uh, point of view. These uh, three different constraints. Uh, 
are managed or integrated in what we call the 3D viscosity map or speed map. This uh, viscosity map is also uh, modulated depending if you are using uh, free flying tubes in order to guarantee the security of the of the flight of the different drones or if you impose a, a, a predefined level for flying uh, to every, every drone or if you use a mix of both of them. With this uh, viscosity map, we start the, the planning uh, process, proper, uh, properly speaking. In this planning process, we have developed different possible planners because we have a different uh, time requirements. We have uh, 3D, 3D with vertical constraints, 3D with horizontal constraints, 2D uh, projected and poorly 4D. And also we have a different planner for each of the different missions, for the coverage uh, area mission, for the linear coverage, and also for the point-to-point -point mission. All this, uh, these paths need to, de need to be uh, deconflicted, especially and temporarily. This can be done, firstly, especially, for instance, in the path planner, or can be uh, in two paths, firstly, especially, and then temporarily, or uh, you can use a 4 d uh, path planner that do both things at the same path. The objective is to, uh, to obtain a path where you have the positions and you have the time and also the speed that you need to have at that time. Uh, the kind of uh, operational area are very different. Some uh, have made a lot of uh, different simulation in, for instance, in, in ports like uh, La Spezia port or Valencia port. La Spezia, we have done a lot of uh, simulations. Other typical area is, is the one like the Marugan airport where we have done uh, real tests. In general, we have considered the possibility, the, the, the use of a five by five meter resolution map. If the area is bigger than three by three kilometers, uh, we have used also 10 by 10 meters. It's not so, uh, so precise, but it's enough for flying. And uh, these uh, maps provided by the different, uh, in the case of Spain, the Instituto Geográfico Nacional, or in case of Italy, of the company that provides the, the leader map, we converted in, uh, in occupancy map in order to plan the, the different paths. These are other kind of uh, environment. This is uh, the Ferrol port. This is interesting because it's very big. This is 10 by 6 kilometer, which is relatively bigger than uh, we have initially considered in the context of the project. And this is another uh, area like the Rosas airport. Well, uh, speaking of the constraint, we manage a different set of constraints uh, in, the, in the path planning. These constraints are uh, the reserved area for, for a flying drone. For instance, if a drone is going to do this path, we need uh, we can reserve this uh, area of the of the airspace for for him for this uh, vehicle. We can also uh, impose a level, fly at 100 meters, whatever the, the the surface on the floor. We can block an area. We can geofence an area in order. To, don't fly over this area because it's military because it's the Real Madrid Stadium and there are a lot of people at that moment. We have also managed uh, what we call uh, risk areas, which is uh, a kind of soft constraint because it's, it's affect uh, to the path planning but not block completely. And also we can define a geofence linked to coverage area or linear coverage area if needed. All these constraints are dynamically analyzed. That means that are considered just when you ask for a plan. Uh, then we ask for a plan, what we consider is the, the state of the system in all of these uh, situation constraints in order to do the plan according to the dynamical photo of the, of the system at that time. Uh, we have defined it, different strategies, different mission, and we need to do uh, the confliction of all of, of all of them. Uh, in the path planning mission, we can use a point to point, for instance, and we can fly uh, at a given level. For instance, if I am going north, we can fly at uh, uh, 100 meters. And if I'm going uh, north to south, just uh, 120, whatever. We can also define free flying tubes in order to warranty more the spatial safety. For the coverage path planning, we can impose a level, which is very typical when we do the coverage for observing a, an area. Typically, you, you do the surveillance at a given uh, altitude. 
the same for the linear coverage. Uh, in the path of confliction, we have three types of the confliction, poorly spatial, poorly temporal, or a mixed spatiotemporal the confliction, depending on the, on the needs. Obviously, the more the safer is the spatiotemporal, but uh, depends on the need of the, of the drone, we can use uh, the three of them. Uh, for the path supervision, we guarantee the safe takeoff at, in, in terms of the confliction. And uh, at the UTM, the, a potential situation of uh, a contingency is analyzed. For instance, if a drone is flying uh, slower and then don't verify the temporal plan or is uh, going out of the, of the physical path in order to, re to replan. And then if this contingency is detected, we do a, a replan. This is an example of a different trajectories in, in a challenging city like, like Madrid. In this case, the flights, some of them are at very low altitude, and this you can see how it adapts to uh, the contours of the buildings. This uh, path planner, what we, we want is a flexibility because we, we need to, we can plan individually, we can plan in a coordinated way for different uh, drones. We can plan individually or we can plan for a set of drones. For instance, we can do the plans for groups of two drones flying together or three drones or four drones, whatever. Another different question, if you have a drone that is able to maintain this, uh, this formation, this is a different thing. But for the planning point of view, we can plan that, particularly for linear coveras and for area coveras, which is more typical. Uh, we have also uh, the possibility of doing the, this path de confliction because path de confliction always means a kind of coordination between the drones because we need to know which is going to be the position of the drone at each uh, time yeah, in, the, in, the, in the future uh, time window. We consider also the possibility of using fixed wind drones and multi-rotor drones, which are different because the requirements are different. The minimum is different. In a multi in a multi-rotor, we can uh, decrease the, the, the speed to zero, but this is not possible in a, in a, uh, in a fixed wind. Uh, the turning angles are much uh, different in both of them, but we consider both things. And with all of this, we generate path plans that provide position, speed, and time. Okay? Position X, Y, Z, and also uh, speed and time at each point. Uh, for the swarm uh, and formation in the cover as planning, linear or area, uh, the swarm uh, can be defined. Uh, typically, it can be a triangle, for instance, and uh, usually we use uh, level impose. Uh, the strategy for the area coverage is typical back and forth, but adapting to the big buildings that can be inside of the inside of the area. This is an example, for instance, in the in La Spezia, of uh, with three drones for covering this in this area. Well, uh, from the technical, more technical part, the method we use for planning is called fast marching square, which is uh, we, we, the kernel we use. The strategies is back and forth and a leader following strategies. This has been included in the path planner. The path planner now is a server that is located in the Universidad Carlos III de Madrid. It's asynchronous. It is called by UTM. That is, in this case, in, in, in Germany. Uh, the path monitoring is done at the UTM, but in case it need to, uh, it is required to replan, it is uh, executed a, a planning. Well, the different planners that we have in, in developed for the for the project uh, are these ones. The the time is very different. The, the characteristics, the, the technical characteristics are different because uh, we have considered different possibilities in time. For instance, the, what we call 2D profile is a fast response planner. We are speaking of uh, less than one second, around uh, 0 0.2 uh, seconds for the response time because in this case. We have considered that in sometimes we need to uh, replan very fast for uh, avoid uh, other problems. The others are uh, a mix in the three, uh, 3D vertical band, 3D horizontal band, and 3D pool. More or less, the, the time is around three seconds, a little more. And in the 4D planning, in this case, due to uh, additional dimension, which is time, it is uh, more costly from. Uh, from a time point of view, the compositional time of view. This, uh, these times are for the Bernabeu area, for the map I have shown you previously. 
And <coughs> in a laptop, in a normal laptop, in a server, it's a little, it's a little less time. Well, the, the confliction, uh, in, in, we have considered time also flexibility. We, we can establish only spatial deconfliction, for instance. <coughs> Imagine you, you are uh, considering a drone, and the drone, you are not sure if, the, if, the, if you can satisfy the time. In this case, you can only uh, order a spatial deconfliction. In this case, we generate tubes, safety tubes for the, for the drones, and this establish a, a reserve in the, in the space area. We can use also temporal deconfliction. In this case, we plan individually and then with the conflict in order that you don't have uh, time. This uh, the confliction time is by, by delaying properly the mission. We can do both, first in spatially and then temporally. Or you can in, in do both, uh, both the confliction at the same time during the planning, which is the 4D path planner, okay? Well, in order to you see some uh, case, this is an example of the level assigned uh, path planning, the case you can see uh, the city of Madrid, and uh, you can impose a determined level for it for the drone flying uh, in some direction, or you can uh, let uh, free, free flying but reserving a tube for for him. The, from the point of view of the of the air traffic, is substantially different. You can see how the, 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 the space, the aerospace is more structured in this case than, the, than in the other. Uh, this is um, a case in La Spezia Port with a mix of point-to-point uh, -point missions and an area cover mission. In this case, we are uh, covering the containers area of this part of the port. And in the others are merely motion from one point to another point. This is an example of constrained area in, in the center of Madrid. This is a, a full geofence this block completely the flies over, in this case, this is the Bernabeu Stadium. And uh, this is a risk area because we consider that there are people uh, walking there because uh, it's before a, a match. And then it's uh, an area that is affected by risk. And then we try not to fly over. That is not a block, but if, if it is possible, uh, the, the path try to avoid this, these areas. This is an example in, in the case in the Ferrol, in La Ría del Ferrol, of different set of mission. This is a typical linear coverage. You can see the, the, dif the different aspects because it has been defined uh, manually. Uh, this is an uh, area coverage, which is automatically defined. The operator only defined the, the stream points. And these are typical point-to-point -point, uh, missions. Yeah? In this case, all of them are uh, the conflict. Here is a detail, and you can see how the, the coverage area adapt to uh, different situations on the terrain, and also if there are obstacles in the terrain, they also uh, adapt in order to avoid uh, to avoid problems. Well, here you can see in the city of Madrid uh, an example. We have represented the, the tubes, the safety tubes. In this case, the, these, uh, these things, inside there is a, a path, and this is the area blocked by the by the path. The, in this case, both paths are going to a, to a start, and then it's fully blocked. It cannot be used for uh, for flying. In this case, these others do not need to fly uh, rounding the the two the two boxes. And in the case you can see how this uh, drone is uh, starting in the center of the of the Bernabeu Stadium and then goes over and then continues by the Castellana Street. And this is a coverage area inside of the center. Well, uh, all these uh, planners are uh, implemented in a, in a server. The server, uh, which is uh, located at the Universidad Carlos III, has the possibility of, uh, of using a different operational area. In this case, because uh, the map is relatively big and then we have managed in that way, we have uh, for each operational area, you have a different uh, environment here, a different module. And then the, this uh, server responds to the petition of the UTM, that in this case the UTM is in Germany. Well, uh, not in, in, in the real test, but in simulation, we have uh, simulated uh, how uh, is the, the situation when do we start to increase the number of vehicles 
in, uh, in, uh, in this restricted area. In this case, is for the center of, of Madrid. We have uh, started to increase the number of vehicles, 5, 10, 15, 10, 20. Uh, we want to test here if the system is able to, mar to guarantee the safety distance. And you can see here how the safety distance, would, the minimum we have considered is 8 cell, which is 40 meters, are maintained even when the number of completed missions are huge. Uh, in this case, these are fully completed missions. This is the horizontal distance and this is the vertical distance, okay? You can see, but the global distance is, is uh, managed to maintain uh, in, in, in eight cell, which is 40 meters. Uh, if we increase the number of, uh, of drones, the, the average speed decreases a little, and the average pass long increase also a little. Uh, what we can see is that the, the, the average flying time decreased. That means because of the, of the saturation of the aerospace, you cannot fly exactly in the moment you want. And then uh, you can see that it's, uh, it's slowly saturation, but over that value, the saturation is very, uh, very clear. Yeah? In this case, we are speaking in an area of three by three kilometers with 25 vehicles. Okay. And for my part, well, this is some publication of, the, of this part. I'm showing you uh, a video of a simulation in order that you can uh, see. Well, yeah, if I can. In this case, there are three drones. Uh, what we, the, the point you are looking here is the safety window and that we are considering in order not to uh, get into contact with other, with other drones and in the more complex test uh, like this. This is the ferrol area, it's much bigger because it's uh, nine kilometers by, by six. These are geofenced areas of the, the city of Ferrol. You can see that the distance are man, managed properly. Okay. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Any question? Or at the end? Sorry? Uh, we consider three three different missions in general for uh, for the in the context of the project, which is the linear coverage of uh, an area, the operator defined a set of points and the drone fly over these points, an area coverage, in this case the operator defined a polygon, and uh, we define a back and forth trajectory for going that. And the other is point-to-point, uh, point, but you can mix because for an area coverage you need to go to the initial position and then you go to the final position to other, to other place. These are the missions we are considering. And in the Ferrol area, this is a little slow, but uh, in this part, I think this is drone. These are go-to point-to-point, I think. This is an area coverage. This is an area coverage. There's a green one that's, okay. that starts in a little, that's an area coverage. Um, well, they are synthetic because we couldn't fly. This, the, these are linear coverage, I think. Um, yeah. Sorry. Um, so, this demonstrated uh, the temporal windows. The, there were two drones, the yellow one and the orange one. What was represented is that they did not collide while in there. So, the space window we were having was enough for security. And you can see that they cross each path many times, so we were validating that part. Uh, th then we have the coverage that is uh, with a very high terrain. There's a very mountain zones, and you can see it goes over with the terrain. And then the green one is the area coverage, where you can see all the functionality. Uh, the purpose is, was just synthetic. There was no surveillance, no nothing. The time window, uh, the safety time window we have considered is one minute. 
which is the yeah. the green uh, squares you, you see. It, obviously, it depends on the on the speed of the drone. This area can be bigger or, or smaller if the drone is at a lower speed. But yeah. it, for instance, today is not clearly defined in the in the regulation. It, probably in the future it will be defined, but now it's not clearly defined. So um, yeah, good morning, everybody here, and those of, those of you that are following us through the YouTube channel. Um, Francisco Alera from Universidad Carlos III in Madrid. Uh, I will be presenting the first part of this short uh, introduction to uh, to the communications in labyrinth. Okay, so um, let me first start with uh, with the question that we asked ourselves five years, five or six years ago, when we were presenting uh, the proposal of labyrinth. Right. Uh, why do we want a 5G UAV? Okay, so um, when we think about 5G, we typically what comes out to our minds is typically this: uh, the cellular technology, radio technology in the mobile phone, right? So when we mix this with, with this technology with UAVs, we comes to this idea of the so-called cellular UAVs. So a cellular UAV is, is known to be one of these two things: either a UAV with cellular technology that can connect through, I don't know, 5G, 4G, or whatever, uh, or a UAV with a portable base station to enable cellular connectivity for other people, right? So certainly, we wanted communications in Labyrinth to be uh, multi-channel. So we wanted to have Wi-Fi connectivity, we want to have satellite connectivity, we wanted to have cellular connectivity, uh, and so on, right? So, so yeah, we wanted to have cellular connectivity, but do we need 5G connectivity? Do we need 5G radio connectivity? That's what we were asking to ourselves. And the answer was definitely no. Uh, so the thing is, we analyzed the requirements. Uh, so the network requirements were not too high. So the delay and the throughput required was not too high. Uh, the number of devices, the number of drones, in fact, were not too high yet. We were thinking about two, three, four drones. Uh, and in general, the 5G KPIs were not very high. So do we need 5G? <laughs> what, this was what we were asking ourselves. Do we need 5G, really? And the answer is definitely yes, because 5G is not only the radio connectivity, which is what normally we think it is. 5G radio is just the tip of the iceberg, right? It's, it's just one small part of, of 5G. Right, if you check here, I'm not going to explain 5G architecture, but if you check, this is the, 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 the standard, right? So if you check here, the radio access network is just a small component of the 5G architecture. So even though we were not such in, we were not so interested in 5G radio, we are really, really interested in 5G technologies, which is what we are coming and we are bringing here to Labyrinth Communications, right? So in this, 5G iceberg that we have out there, uh, the cellular technology, the radio technology, is just a, a small part of where, what we want, okay? So we just dive a little bit in the, in the ocean of, of technologies, we, we realize that we really want the flexibility provided by 5G network technologies to guide our current and our future communications uh, far beyond what is possible with classical network architecture, right? So, uh, what are we interested in, or why are we interested in 5G? Well, the Labyrinth uh, architecture has been built upon three main 5G pillars. So, these are the three main things that we're using here in Labyrinth from the communications point of view. So, we have first the SDN, which is the, the software defined networking is the technology that is going to allow us to have a flexible interface management and data flow control. So the idea is that there are going to be a lot of interfaces in the drones, in the UAVs. As I was commenting before, we are going to have satellite, we're going to have the Wi-Fi, uh, the radio frequency line of sight, so, and we'll have many others, many other alternatives, right? And we want to manage all of them together so, that we, as, as, so as to be able to have uh, flexible and dynamic communication management so that we can integrate them all in a common communication infrastructure. Right? Uh, then we have 
this idea of the NFB, the Network Function Virtualization. With this idea, or with this technology, which is, which is a, a 5G technology, we are going to be able to flexibly deploy new functionalities in the drones. We are going to be able to, uh, to, uh, to include new applications in the drones dynamically. We are going to be able to update the software which is in the drones dynamically. Right? And finally, we have the 5G core integration that is going to allow us to have the labyrinth communications architecture compatible with the 5G standard. So these are the three main pillars that we have in our, in our communications, right? Uh, obviously, I'm not going to go, to, to go into the, all, the, to the details of, the, of what we did. You, you have here a QR code you can scan just to check uh, the, the details later. Uh, but I just want to show you this, this, uh, this picture where you can see here this communication mesh that we are building. Here is where the SDN pillar is working. So we have all the communication alternatives here, satellite, radio, Wi-Fi, or 5G, 4G, whatever. And they are going to be building this communication mesh so that the UAV is going to be able to automatically use whatever is necessary. If one of them is falling, if the, I don't know, if the satellite communication is not available or the Wi-Fi communication is not available, the system will automatically reconfigure itself so that you can have another alternative. You can also have the, you, you are going to have the NFB that I was commenting before here, so that we can have applications automatically and flexibly deployed in the ground control station or in the drones. We can have many different drones, in fact, okay? And finally, we are going to have the 5G core, the 5G standard that we were commenting before, right? So this is, we will see some more details about this later, okay? <clears throat> And finally, we have here, uh, I, I just, just for you to have them, and you can check, the, check them before, afterwards, sorry, uh, the different uh, contributions that we did to the different scientific uh, venues, scientific uh, uh, magazines and journals, and some contributions to standards, right? So to end my, 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 my introduction, let me introduce uh, uh, Jose Manuel Manjón from Telefonica Research and Development that, are going to, that is going to show you how all these tips, all, all these ideas about the 5G that I have just commented, finally fit into the labyrinth full architecture, including all the different stakeholders that you have already seen, including the drones, the ground control station, the UTM, the, the US space part, and, and so on. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, please, uh, Jose. <coughs> Okay, thank you so much, uh, Paco, for the introduction. So let me talk now about the how we set these uh, technologies in the in, in, in the project. Now, so the, the objective of this uh, work package of communication is to to design, uh, deploy, and validate the, the communication platform that support all these uh, communication alternatives that we commented. And we uh, to do this, uh, we differentiate uh, three main domains, uh, which are the, the UAV domain, um, the GCS domain, and the UTM domain. So and uh, with this uh, differentiation of, of the domains, uh, we, <clears throat> as, as Paco commented, not only are focused on the cellular communication of the of 5G, but on, but we focus on the SDN, NFB, and the 5G uh, among the, the, the cellular uh, communication, which are the, the 5G core, for example. And this allow us uh, to have a multi-interface UAV network that support uh, Wi-Fi, uh, radio frequency, which is the the legacy communication of the of the drone, satellite, and the cellular communication itself. And um, um, okay, this first. Uh, this is the the main work uh, we have done in. In the, in the work package that we created a, a res reliable, robust, and a resilient uh, architecture. Uh, here we can see the, the three differentiated domains. And uh, we built a, a flexible architecture where, uh, for, um, beginning with the uh, communication among the UAVs itself, that uh, we can see in, in the left side the two boxes that represent the, the UAVs and we can create a network of UAVs uh, communicated by by Wi-Fi uh, by uh, uh, the interface manager that you see 3M uh, uh, developed uh, 
and this interface manager uh, allows us <coughs> to accommodate the different uh, communication alternatives uh, that we can see. So uh, first of all, um, to communicate the UAV with the GCS, as as we have the use cases that we are we have known locations, for example, the the port or the airport that are known locations. So for this, uh, we can we can use uh, also fixed uh, communication as as we know where they are going to be. But for the uh, the other use cases, the road transport, uh, we need to use uh, some com uh, alternative that. Uh, allow us the this uh, this mobility so and also this type of architecture allow us to uh, not to use a unique communication among the the whole architecture for example the uab can communicate communicate the gcs by radio frequency which is the legacy communication and uh, is the let's say the easy way to communicate that wrong with the gcs and then to once the data is on the on the gcs we can go through, for example, as I said, a, a fixed access, access is we, if we know when, where we are, to, to pass this, this information, this traffic to the UTM, then to manage this, these drones. Or maybe we can, we can mix the, the drone communication, the drone can communicate via Wi-Fi to the, to the GCS, and the GCS can also use the 5G, 4G cellular connectivity to reach the UTM or also internet if we want to, to do some stream of video or something like that. And this, uh, all these tests, this communication tests have been evaluated and demonstrated in, first of all, in the five tonic and telephonic laboratories when we emulated, uh, as, as these are um, laboratories, uh, we emulated the, the drones uh, by software. So we, we emulated the the communication of this interface manager with some alternatives of uh, Wi-Fi, 4G, and the legacy communication. And then we also uh, some field uh, test with Ita and Archimea with this interface manager that UC3M developed. And also uh, DLR contribute with the satellite communication with some test in their in their drone. Uh, just to finalize, uh, let me talk a bit uh, about uh, some of the tests we have uh, carried out in the Telefonica, which uh, involve the access gateway function and the 5G core. The, the access gateway function um, is an equipment that provides an interworking between the fixed uh, locations and the 5G core and provide uh, 5G services to to equipment that are non-5G terminals. So we have uh, residential gateways that are non-5G, but we can make uh, them like 5G terminals by uh, going through the access gateway function. And the access gateway function, as is uh, a 5G uh, equipment by uh, herself, can communicate with a 5G core. And to do this, we use the free 5G core which is the, an open source project that uh, emulate all the elements that are involved in the in the core that uh, we previously showed the the, the the architecture of the 5G core, and we can emulate this uh, 5G free 5G core, and we did some tests uh, about uh, this combination of the access gateway function and the 5G core uh, emulating a a UIV going through this whole network to reach uh, finally internet or other network uh, who can be, uh, for example, the, the UTM. So this is all the work, uh, a summary of the work that we have done in Work Package 4. If you have any question, if not, we can go to the next uh, presenter. Thank you so much. <coughs> Okay, our next speaker is going to be uh, uh, in the work in cybersecurity and it's going to be Oliver Young. Please, Oliver. So, uh, good morning, everybody. I uh, would like to introduce myself first. So, my name is Oliver Jung. I'm a scientist at the Austrian Institute of Technology in the Department of Digital Safety and Security. And we were having a look at the security issues in, in labyrinth, um, basically defining, trying to, to do a, yeah, consider security um, right from the beginning and doing a, following a security by design approach. 
Um, in the end, I think I, I mentioned this also later, but um, in the end, of course, the Labyrinth is a research project, so we do not expect that all security requirements are fulfilled uh, that we defined. But of course, if we a system like this goes operational, these things should be considered. Um, we recently also did, did finally uh, a survey on the on the actual security measures that have been implemented, and we found out that yeah, quite of, quite some of them have been actually implemented in Labyrinth, but of course not all of them. So if we think um, about the uh, about the security in in the UAV domain, uh, we first have considered what what has been presented before. Um, so there, we have quite some some communications in the in the system um, between different kinds of access networks like satellite networks, uh, classical, uh, mobile mobile radio. We also have Wi-Fi. All these these uh, different access technologies come with with different kinds of of um, security security features. They come with different security requirements, and we try to incorporate everything um, in in our system. Um, you also have different different passes where you do the communications between um, yeah between the, the base station that might be co connected in, on the fixed network that might be connected to the to a mobile network. Um, yeah, all the, all the different kinds of of issues we have to consider when when defining a security architecture for for a system like Labyrinth is rather a, a complex system in the end. Um, so when we are thinking about Cybersecurity. We have to consider quite quite some things that um, uh, that I would like to 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 highlight now. Um, you know, cybersecurity is a critical issue in for, in particular if you think about safety. Um, so we have a, a, a drone, a UAV is in the end it's a cyber physical systems, and um, what is important for these kind of system, of course, is always is are two things: it's, it's availability and safety. So in the end, um, if you think about an attacker that is actually able to attack our system in, in Labyrinth, he might get even control over the drone and might um, steer it in, in some um, some building or in some crane uh, where we had in this is uh, La Spezia use case or maybe even in a, in a group of people. So we, in any case, we want uh, to avoid that that attackers can get access over our, over our drone. Um, so we need a, a couple of well-established cybersecurity measures in order to, to protect the system from att attackers. And um, we also have to make sure to assure that it's these, um, this set of requirements we define here, it's more or less, more or less complete. Um, in order to define our security requirements, we first have to think about the, the vulnerability of the systems. What are the threats to the system? How, how uh, and how an attacker could could use these um, these vulnerabilities in order, in the end, to launch launch an attack. And finally, once we've we've defined our security requirements, we also have to make sure that the set of requirements is is complete. So in the end, we after having defined the set of security requirements, we also have to do some verification and validation of the requirements that this is complete. So, um, taking one step back um, about security, cybersecurity functions in general, and what kind of functions we, we address in Labyrinth, we um, have, can have a look at the uh, NIST cybersecurity framework that defines the five different functions for, for cybersecurity. So first there is, that work? Here, here. Uh, first there is identify. So first you need to identify your system. Um, you need to identify what, what are the different parts of the system, what are the different um, security requirements, but also what are the threats to, 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 your, to, the, to the different parts of your system. Then, of course, once you have identified um, the system and the threats, you have to protect your system. The, on one hand side means that you have to define the security requirements, but of course, on the other hand, it means that you have uh, to implement the security measures. So we did it in this, we addressed this protect issue in two ways. 
So on one hand side, we, we defined a right, quite comprehensive set of security requirements. On the other hand side, we also had a look in, in specific cryptographic mechanisms that um, we tried to tailor for the for the um, for the domain for the UAV domain in order to mainly protect user privacy um, and user data privacy. Um, in the end, then we were also addressing the or we are also addressing the detect functionality. So detect means that we do anomaly detection. Uh, using um, actually the, the test flight data in order to do, to find potential attacks in the in the data. Um, for the protect phase, we were making quite heavy use of uh, the IEC 62443, what is a, um, a standard framework for defining security requirements for for control systems. So in in particular for industrial control systems, but it can be also mapped up or to, to other other domains, like we can see here for for the UAV domain. So first, we, what we start would go back again, having a look at the different kinds of threats and attacks to to our system. So on one hand, side, starting from the well-known viruses, swarms, malware, swar um, malware. Um, in theory, of course, you can have a Viruses um, everywhere in your, in your system where you have a, some some computing platform, um, and that you are able to to run some some software. So probably here most um, most vulnerable to these kind of attacks would probably be the, the ground control station, but maybe also the UTM. Um, so if an attacker is able to to install malware on the system, he might get control <coughs> over, over the system. Then we have, you have a whole class of, of it's called concert, uh, concert, concerned with the modification of system, modification of, of sharing data. So um, since you, you use heavy, heavy, use, heavy use of, of radio, radio technology, um, this is a, a major issue here. Um, so we have different kinds of routing attacks, um, UAV capture attacks. So there are actual, actual examples where Attackers were able to, to capture UAV by, by doing um, GPS spoofing, for example. Uh, you could also, of course, uh, try to manipulate the, the mission of the UAV in order to um, yeah, disturb the, the, the mission. And finally, so there's a whole group of, of attacks uh, around message forgery, UAV spoofing, where we would actually try to, to claim you are the UAV and um, transmitting um, transmitting or providing data on behalf of the, let's say, original UAV. And finally, what is a, a major major issue? It's a GPS spoofing. Um, and also, um, um, not only here, it's not only to the radio signal, but of course, also to the signal or the location data that is that is transmitted within the within the in the radio network. So uh, how we actually did it, first of all, um, yeah, let's have a focus on the identify and protect area of functionality. Um, so we, at AIT, we, we uh, developed a tool that is called ThreatGet to support, um, yeah, to support, support uh, developing systems after the IEC, IEC 62443 standard. Um, so we, we develop a whole model of, 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 the, of the labyrinth system in order to, to deal with the security vulnerabilities in the system. Um, based on the vulnerabilities, we define a whole a set of security requirements to achieve our cybersecurity goals. Um, so we also finally then, uh, like mentioned before, based on the Final results. We, we um, then again um, try to to verify our security requirements by um, applying a, an ontology-based approach, where we did build an ontology of our labyrinth system that can be uh, automated, where you can do an automized uh, verification of requirements. And finally, what I mentioned, so we are not aiming at at um, implementing 
all the security measures and meeting all the requirements that have been defined for Labovent. Um, so what did we actually do for, for the threat get analysis? So we started with the threat analysis. So we did a quite comprehensive analysis of threat by having a look at, at, at the, let's say, scientific literature um, on the domain. And we were able to, 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 to identify quite some vulnerabilities. So we, we added these to our database that is actually used by the ThreatGet tool in order to define the security requirements for the different components. Um, then we did, a, after this, we did a, a risk analysis of the, of the system and uh, by subdividing the, the system into five different, um, let's say, five different scenarios. So the safe operation of the UAV would be one, was one of them. Um, yeah, that the operation would, would be stopped at, in general. Um, we have, we're thinking about financial impacts of an attack, um, the breach of data, data in, integrity, like, like for example, the, the mission data, and finally also about breach of data confidentiality, meaning that, uh, let's say, the user data of the, of the UV is, is um, leaked to unauthorized persons. So based on the on the impact and the likelihood of attacks, you do finally then a, a risk analysis. So these are the, the the part of the risk analysis. On one hand side, there's a likelihood. Then you consider the, the impact in the risk analysis in order to then finally get a rating of your risk. And of course, when you start then defining your security requirements, you should first um, having a, a having a look at the most severe risk and also. Um, define appropriate measures and requirements for the severe risk. Um, so um, we built, um, from this, we built a, a model of the whole labyrinth system, um, taking into account the different components of the system. Um, so there's the UAV. So let's start here. So the, as it started, the ground, there's a ground control station. Um, so there's first of all an overall model, overall high-level model. Then we build it all the models for the individual uh, components. So there's a ground control station. We build it also a sub-model for the UAV. Um, there's then the, the bridge and server. And finally, there's all the, then the, the UTM. So for all these, these different kinds of components, we build it, a, let's say, a high-level model to define security requirements on so-called risk um, zones and conduits that's uh, following the, the approach defined by IEC 62443. Where each of these, uh, these is a zone, these colored components. And um, based on these zones, um, we get a more detailed sub-zones here. And the approach of, 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 the, of the standard is that we define security requirements on one hand side for the zones and on, on the other hand side for the, for the connections in between the zones. And um, the, for the, this zone, there's a unique set of, of requirements. Um, based on the threat of re requirements, we also had a look at the, um, at the actual, let's say, what is called security services or security measures. Um, based on ITUT X800, defining security measures for, for different um, layers of the OC reference model. And we considered these measures also then in our labyrinth model, finally. Um, so having an overview about the overall, overall approach. So here you can see, let's say, on our threat database. This is our, our foundation, the threat database, including the, the risk analysis. So you see also here the, the risk rating of, of these different kinds of, of threats. Um, so we do a threat, critic, uh, set classi um, threat classification from, uh, I think you can't see it, so, so there's a quite a number, the highest number is considered to be a denial of service attacks. So these are attacks against the availability of the system. Um, there are quite some attacks against information disclosure. And um, so there's also spoofing. There is um, deviation of, of privileges. And there is also 
um, tampering, and finally there are also some attacks against reputation. Um, so on one hand side the classification, then there is also the risk evaluation using this, this risk analysis approach, and uh, so finally um, we have the, all the all the inputs we need finally to do the definition of the security requirements. Um, so the, let's say the standard is is uh, is providing already some is providing some set of security requirements. Um, we had to um, then de select depending on the actual threats and the actual risk rating in in the system. Um, so we now define the set of requirements, and after defining this set of requirements, we wanted also to make sure that this set of requirements is is complete. Um, for doing this, we um, went one step back um, and and uh, tried again to 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 model the system in another way. Um, and um, for this, we were using an, an ontology that is covering all the all the aspects we we um, we considered for our our model. So um, this ontology is considering the different components, the subcomponents, the connections between the components, but all of the set of re security requirements for each of these zones and, and coordinates, meaning that for the components and the connection, um, communication connections between these components. Um, and um, so then we were using, um, on one hand side, the, the, set, of the set of requirements. On, on the other hand, we did another, another model of our, our Threat, threat, uh, threat findings, and now try to find the matching between the actual, actual set of requirements and the and the threats. And um, by using this, we were also able then finally to to verify that we have a complete set of requirements and would in, in theory in theory also be able to um, to identify open issues. Um, so this more or less was the. Let's say the issues we we uh, were addressing concerning design phase of the system. Um, then we also had the some issues more on the cryptographic algorithm. We had a look at so we were um, looking at uh, two specific algorithms: one for authenticated key exchange, where it is possible um, to um, do a to exchange of keys and the authentication of the of the of the um, of the communication partners in in more or less in one one algorithm, um, and we are in particular having a look at um, at authenticated key exchange where you are not not uh, where you don't need to reveal the identities of the different parties. Um, the other issue we are we having lo a look at. Um, was into um, forward secrecy and zero round trip time mechanisms for for key exchange. So this is again something you would would apply in the UAV domain because you you have uh, limited resources for communication on the wireless channel. Um, this means that you can do a, a key exchange without uh, a lot of of message exchanges and. Um, um, so we worked on the implementation of these zero round trip time um, mechanisms in the UAV domain that that is um, using less resources. Um, finally, let's have a look at uh, let's say detect phase. Um, this is something we are still working on because we got the test data only two weeks ago, um, and um, to, to make a reasonable reasonable um, decisions about the algorithm and the parameterization of the algorithms, uh, we actually need the, the real real data to work with. Um, so this also it's uh, so it's also affecting the finally the approach we are using um, because on one hand side we we get a, a set of of unlabeled data, so we need uh, need to have a um, a mechanism that um, can be used for unsupervised learning. So this is a, a let's say a machine learning approach we are using. So it's called um, um, that's using a density based clustering, and actually the the 
algorithm we are finally decided about is called GPScan. So we try to find, um, let's say, uh, data points with similar features, try to cluster them in order then finally to find the outliers. So you want to, to detect um, the, the data points that are not, uh, not part of the, of the cluster. And of course, these, these, uh, these outliers, um, say a potential reason for these um, outliers could be a, a cyber attack. But of course, could also be a system malfunctioning. Um, in order to finally to def define if it's a, um, if it's a potential cyber attack or if it's maybe a system failure, we also try then to to incorporate um, network data in order to 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 uh, have different data sources in order to make a better dis decision about this. Since we we consider this uh, data set more or less free of errors, and we also need, uh, need to label this data. In the end, um, we decided also then to, to inject faults into, into, into the data set, meaning on one hand side to the telemetry data, and also then to the, to the networking data in, to, in order to make sure we, we can identify something in the data set. Oops. This was the wrong. <laughs> um, so, what is the time, um, the pipeline we are using to to finally build the algorithm? So, first we need to have a look at the data, what what we did already, and um, so we have to do a classification, a characterization of the data, what information is contained in this, this data set. And then we have to decide about the uh, actual features in the data set that uh, that can be used um, for training our on one for training our algorithm and in order to define the uh, identify the outliers in the training set. So we have to um, find a proper proper time frame for for the clustering um, and choose a significant distance metric, meaning the the metric for defining the distance between two data points in order to, to de identify finally outliers that would have a, a significant higher distance um, than the other one. Um, these would then the, be the, the, the so called the noisy points in the data set. Um, so we have then, of course, extract the outliers um, and, and match it with, with, with the data, uh, with the, with the um, baseline data, um, so we can identify the attacks and finally what what i mentioned already probably have to also to to introduce some um, artificially anomalous points in the data sets in order to to test the uh, algorithms robust and if the algorithm is finally working so this would be the ste step that we would be considered finally the, the verification and, and validation of, of our approach so um to conclude there we are, we are we are uh, covering quite some uh, functions of the of the of the um, cybersecurity lifecycle, meaning that we cover within in labyrinth to identify the protect and all of the detect functions. So we're starting with uh, doing let's say a comprehensive uh, analysis of the of the whole labyrinth model. Um, I think I can claim this is a, let's say the most complete. Uh, figure of, of the system. Uh, we did yeah, quite heavily cooperating, cooperation did heavy, heavily cooperating with Work Package 5 and Work Package 4. Uh, that was defining the communication architecture finally. And we then, uh, def based on this, based on the model, we defined the security requirements and finally also did the verification of the uh, requirements using a system ontology. So we, we we're using, uh, we're improving cryptographic algorithms for doing key exchange in, in the domain, um, taking into account the limitations of the, of, of the UAV, UAV system. And then we are based on a detailed threat analysis of the, of the, of the final system. Um, we were uh, working, well, we are, we are actually working still on the, on the anomaly detection for detecting suspicious behavior, to, for detecting outliers in our data set. 
Okay, thank you. That concludes my talk. And are there any questions? Uh, our next uh, speaker is going to be uh, David Sand from the DLR that is going to present the US space and the GCS uh, system. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm David Sai from DLR, and in our part of the project, we created the UTM server and therefore uh, the implementation of the US space system. First, a uh, little bit of background of the project. The, with the drones being more common in the airspace, it's clear that we need some way of managing this traffic that it's completely different from what we are used to in civil aviation for basically two reasons. The first one is that as drones uh, don't have a pilot in itself, most of them are able to fly, to fly beyond line of sight. And the second is the density and the places they are flying. For example, if, as um, the Carlos Tercero has explained before, uh, these drones can fly inside of the cities between the buildings around places with mass events, etc. So it's clear that the normal aviation traffic system based on uh, tra uh, air traffic controllers cannot be implemented. And that's what US space is. US space is a concept of implementation, a way of creating a system to control these drones unmanned without people having to interact directly with the drones without the air traffic. This implementation is in a very high level. It's not specifically with the language of the, it has to be programmed, how should everything be done. It's just a way or the set of services that should be necessary for it to be uh, implementable. And that's what uh, DLR has implemented. And a way or a, a, a specification of the US space system such an in such a way that it can be used in different use cases. Um, the objective was not to create it for only this, but to, generate, to create a general system that could be used just to control this traffic. When it comes to the implementations, use space defines a set of services that should be independent from each other and that are able to communicate between them and give the information. These services range from identification of the drone to tactical conflict resolution to legal recording, so they are very, very extensive. And what we have done is a UTM, or a un um, Unmanned Tracking Management, uh, Traffic Management, sorry. Uh, this server bundles a set of these US space services, the most common ones, and gives an endpoint so the GCS and the drones can communicate with it and report information, receive flight plans, etc. The idea is that not only it can be used this bundled system of uh, US space services, but it can connect with services from other people, or for example, if we need someone to give information about meteorological, it cannot be inside of the system, it might be another company, we have the planner that the Carlos III has done that it's not inside of our server, but it still is part of the US space system and therefore it is a possibility to connect with them. As how do we interact with this server? We have two main ways. First is an API that accepts JSON messages and it's very easy to implement in, in, inside of applications, inside of the GCSs. And it's a way for sending everything, from receiving reports, from sending the flight plans, to get all the warnings, etc. And as a way of helping the system and to have a more visual way of showing the UTM and what's happening behind, we have the web app that it's uh, an application that can be connected through the through webs as a website and gives all the information visually. It gives the position of the drones, what are they doing what flight plans are they flying, if there are geofences around or geocases that have to be followed, any warnings, etc. And this is meant to be as a helper for the GSS and for the operators, as instead of having to implement fully all the API by themselves, they can have some, some of the parts of the system outsourced. Um, these are all the US space requirements. As it can be seen, it's um, impossible to do them all in just once, especially because there are some uh, such as ATC communications that could be just a project by themselves. So what we have done is instead of trying to do everything, do the core ones that are the ones with the ticks and create a basic version that can be used as a prototype for then to be completely implemented in the future. 
Um, let's do a little revisor of everything. First, we have identification and tracking. A uh, UTM system without tracking the drones makes no sense. And basically, what we have created is an identification system that gives an ID to any edge of the drones and uniquely identifies them as a existing object. And then the tracking. Um, uh, all drones report their position every second, and this is saved on the system and showed for any other or for their own operators and for other operators that could be interested in that information. Once we have the information about the drones, we can start th thinking about the airspace. Um, basically, there are two main ideas, is to be able to separate a drone inside of, a, of his own geo cage, meaning the drone cannot leave that box and therefore it's flying independently from the airspace around. And then we have the opposite, this, the idea. We don't want a drone to enter any space, so we create a geofence that blocks the, the space around it, so drones don't fly in, in it. Then, uh, uh, once we have fences and we have the drones, which we can start thinking about operations. Where are we going? What are we doing to fly? And this is basically what, um, what is done with the path planner. The objective is to be able to compute the plans and then separate them both strategically, as in other words, before knowing what's going to happen, and tactically if something happens while the, fly, the drone is flying. Uh, oh. Oh. OK, <laughs> sorry, there, there was another <laughs> slide over here and it's disappeared. Um, for a tactical resolution, for example, what could happen is that the, the original plan was to go from A to B, and then a uh, geofence has to be created in the middle because of an emergency, and therefore the plan has to be changed. This, it is automatically done by the UTM that detects this situation and changes the flight plan, sending it back again to the operator. Um, these are some ways of creating the flight plans because it's important. It's a core part of the project, the idea is to be able to move the drones easily. Uh, the first one is via the API, just sending the flight plan as a JSON, and this is very good for implementing on the GCSs or to do it from a software development perspective, but sometimes that's not an option and we have the possibility to upload the flight to the web app so it could be prepared beforehand or even to create them manually using the application. And then ooh, they are changed, okay, <laughs> that's why it changed. Sorry for the. This is the this is the example of the um, about the what I was talking. We had a flight plan from A to B, but in the middle we had to create a geofence, and therefore the flight plan has to be redirected. This is an an example case of it. And finally, of course, uh, assuming everything was fine, it, this shouldn't be necessary. But as normal as it doesn't happen normally, we have to have into account any non-nominal situations such as a drone getting out of its geo cage and therefore invading an airspace that it shouldn't be invading. When this happens, a set of warnings have to be created, therefore management of the emergencies. And for in this case, for example, what it is done is to create a geofence around the drone. So in case of um, the drone getting out, it still gets protected from the any flying drones around. Other things that are important are, from the monitoring perspective, all this data has to be saved for legal reasons and it has to be controlled so it can then be used for other traffic members, etc. As a side point, apart from all these operations, the idea of DLR is to continue with this server and to keep uh, creating all the different use space services so it can finally become a complete implementation of the, of the CONOPS. Um, some of them are density management, that it's going to happen in a future project, and then maybe adding a meteorological system with some of the components of the DLR, etc. So once we, so once we have everything, we would probably have the first, one of the first uh, use space complete implementations. And as a side note also, I want, uh, we wanted to comment that when using real drones, we normally have a limit of how much we have, normally three or four at the maximum. Not because uh, it's not possible, but because it's hard to have that many drones flying at the same time by anyone. So a very good way to test very, very huge amounts of drones are via simulators. And the one we implemented was the Delft Blue Sky Open Air Traffic Simulator that it's used for normal air traffic. But right now, it's implementing several types of drones, and they can create up to 100, 200 drones at the same time and connect them to our UTM to test uh, actual real traffic management in a, very good, in a very big system. And that's all. Thank you for listening. Any questions, any doubts? Oh, OK. So thanks for your listening. <laughs>
In this uh, second part, we will start with the case uh, study, and then we will uh, continue with policies and standardization. For the case uh, study, the different tastes and use cases are going to be presented by David Seid, the Deller in Germany, and for Angela Ayuso from Archimea. Uh, when, when you want. Hello, everyone. Um, as we've heard this morning uh, I'll, uh, about the technologies, and is it working? Okay. Uh, We've, we've heard about the technologies used and the development of the tool, but at the end of the day, without use cases, it makes no sense to produce anything. Uh, we are trying to arrive to real solutions, and uh, we wanted to. Uh, we are going to present what the use cases have been for this project and what types of studies there have been done and why. Uh, I will start with road transport. Uh, there are four main use cases: road transport, emergencies. Air, air transport and uh, maritime uh, imports, okay? And I will start with this one. For road transport, the objective was to show if it was possible to help with the traffic control, with detecting the speed of vehicles to um, possible infractions using instead of traditional methods, drones, and, and to showcase some of the flexibility for this to test this, there were two, two different cases. The first one was directed towards speed metering, and the objective was to, from the headquarters, to send some drones to a road, and using the using the planner, etc., to send them towards the position safely. And then, once they are after the position, give them a space so they can freely position towards the street and uh, try to detect their speed. For the speed detection, what it was used was a artificial intelligence-based system that tracked and detected the drones via computer vision and then transformed from the plane of the image to the plane of the ground, obtaining a position estimate that was able to, with, with it possible to detect the speed of the vehicle. And for example, other options could be to detect the distance between vehicles, etc. And this was done using a, an application, and the best benefits it has is that it can control multiple drones at the same time with only one application. And each of the, from each of the cameras, it can detect 20, 30 cars at the same time. It might not be as precise as any real speed metering tool, but it can give a first version of what the speed could be. The next project was instead of trying to directly calculate speed, to give a more general view of road transport and what it could do. And for this one, the objective was to send the children from the headquarters in the middle of the airport and control instead of just one road, a full zone around the airport. In this case, two drones were used also with the cameras and sent to different zones and to simulate what could be a case that it would be, for example, that go to the, you arrive to the street and the zone has no interest in whatsoever instead of staying in that, cancel that zone, and then go to another and study that, um, that zone. And as everything done, the, the idea is that it's very easy to move around the drones and to get the, um, put them statically. And I also wanted to showcase the ability of the camera of the drone because it's pretty amazing. Both of these pictures are taken with the drone static on the same position, 120 meters before the ground, above the ground. And we have both a very, um, far away shot where you can see density, where you can check general view of the street, and then get up to really close and see how the car is moving, the, the plate, what the driver is doing inside of it. And it cannot be shown in this scene, but it's possible to track the vehicles with the application and to keep the visual line with the vehicle through all the space and therefore detecting possible more, more specific details of the vehicle that maybe with manual flying it would be impossible. Um, then we have the emergency cases. Um, in this case, the objective was to try how it could help in somewhere that it's over there, and what could be done to serve, in, um, to serve for emergencies and for mass evacuation. For the first case, the idea was to simulate an accident on the street that happened over here while we were in the headquarters. And once the, there was an, uh, an advice that it was happening something, at first, drone is sent to give a visual aid of the situation and assess what could happen. Then a secondary drone is sent with a defibrillator that we can see over here. 
in the camera. And afterwards, um, to test what could a uh, uh, thing that could happen is that the drone gets uh, out of battery, and therefore it's important to and, and we could lose visual sight. So what is done is to send another drone, this one, and once it arrives, return the other one, so it is possible to maintain eternally this visual aid and uh, without while changing the batteries constantly. And the second case, it's a mass evacuation case. It's completely different in this idea. It's that there should be a match in, for example, uh, the Bernabeu uh, field. This is a representation in geo in boxes of what the space around the the Bernabeu is 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 actually like these are the buildings around the Bernabeu and this is the central part. And the idea was to send two drones to give a general surveillance around the area. And one of them detects uh, what could be a problem in over here in this point. So what it is done is to send uh, another drone with a megaphone. Oh, it completely changed the volume, sorry. Uh, with a megaphone that, uh, that uh, informs the people around that point that there should be an evacuation and please to follow the, another drone with a light and safely guide them through the system. This is a very use, good use case of emergency uh, fences. So the area around the evacuation point is completely depleted from drones. And it is possible to move the people and to control the drones manually while still giving a very good sense of security. And if you, if someone wants to give any, yeah, any points around what the conclusions were for the flights, yeah, I can. I can give it to you. Yeah, uh, from here, or should I get on the stage? Well, thank you for the introduction. <laughs> well, my name is Daniel. And representing Samur, which is the well residents from Madrid, we know us pretty well, I guess. And we are the medical, the emergency medical service in Madrid. And <clears throat> we moved to Lugo to perform a couple of drills. And we took, I I, I think we learned very, this is better, yeah, uh, very good lessons from what we saw there. So good lessons and some not so good lessons, but um, overall very good things to improve and I think we learned a lot. And well, in particular for the car accident, <clears throat> we took as a, as a lesson that probably the system is still too slow in order to put the, the drones on, on the scene. In an emergency, every, every, second, every second counts. And the perception that we had is that the system is still too slow to send the plans or the routes or to the, to the drones. <clears throat> but on the other hand, we saw very good things, like having uh, eyes on the sky so we could assess the, the scene from the distance before even before the ambulance ar arrives. Because sometimes the first responder, the person who is there uh, on, the, on the phone, well, they, they're not professionals, obviously, and, and they don't really know what's happening, if the person is breathing or not. And we're able, just with the image as professionals, we're able to, to see what's, what's happening. And I think having, having the eyes on the sky, as I call them, as I call it, having the, the cameras or the drone with the camera assessing the situation, I think it's, it was amazing. I mean, it, it was awesome. It was very good. Also, developing, developing the defibrillator, uh, as we did, to the scene, that saves a life. That time, uh, sending the defibrillator is, that saves a, a life. So I think there's not, not, not much uh, to say. And for the second, for the second uh, drill, what, uh, which was the stadium, uh, there were also a, a few things uh, that can be addressed and improved, but I think this worked uh, better overall. Because it was a planned situation, so we needed we we didn't need the, the fast uh, deployment of the drones. They were already there because it's a mass gathering event. We know it's going to happen, so we had we have the drones already there, and time is not such an issue. And the thing we learned is that probably uh, the the height should be lowered. We proposed. I think a height that was probably too much, so the loudspeaker couldn't be heard. But that's that can be easily addressed, improving the loudspeaker or the PA system, 
or lowering the flying the flying head. So, well, I think in general it was pretty good. It was amazing being there with you, seeing the drones in person. We had never seen. We don't have a, a, a drones department in Samur yet, and it was amazing, seriously, being there and well working with you. So, I I have to thank you all for that. Yes, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Simone Facciardi from the Port of La Spezia. And uh, I, I would like just to, to talk about the, the tests done in La Spezia. Um, I don't want to uh, annoy you about the part of the technical that is uh, on, not on my domain and was uh, excellently explained by uh, Luis and uh, all the other uh, project uh, partners before the launch. Um, I, I would like just to talk about the, the Port of La Spezia that is in Italy, is in Liguria, uh, between uh, Genoa and uh, um, uh, Pisa in the, the northern uh, Italy, uh, in the middle. And uh, uh, what, uh, because, uh, uh, why uh, the port is, the port is involved in, the, in this project? Uh, because the Port of La Spezia is a, a, a well-complicated port, uh, uh, like most in Italy, but uh, uh, La Spezia has a, sp a particular, specifically, um, uh, activity that is uh, uh, an um, important uh, container terminal, the second in Italy, and uh, um, with high, high uh, levels of uh, uh, density uh, within the, the yards, and also the most important uh, military base in Italy. Uh, and this is important because for the authorization uh, process of the port, oh, to, in order to to fly over the port, it's uh, we have a special rules to be followed by the the national uh, regulation. So, uh, and the other thing is that the constraints, the constraints given by some uh, in the port, we have cranes, we have uh, stacks of containers. We have uh, high, uh, lev um, uh, high uh, um, level of, uh, of um, obstacles and uh, moving, <laughs> so, so it's not uh, so easy to fly over there. For this reason, the context analysis that we did uh, in collaboration with the partners is uh, uh, on the Italian maps. Uh, um, there is uh, this is the Italian uh, civil aviation um, has uh, maps uh, we identify the, the the areas and the restriction as you can see the port of La Spezia that is in the Gulf of La Spezia it's uh, it's on, in red so you can fly without uh, exceptional uh, authorization. Uh, talking about the use case, the use case was. Uh, um, um, shared with uh, uh, the port authority the, with the terminal operator because the port authority has the domain only on the infrastructure, but while the operations are um, awarded and uh, uh, carried out by the, the private operator, and the, um, the the three activities of the use case were the control of the perimeter of the terminal, uh, the control of storage areas in order to evaluate if all the uh, containers are stuck in a well way, uh, all the uh, trucks are uh, traveling within the port areas without problems, and uh, all the equipment is uh, correctly uh, efficient uh, working in the port. And also the control of areas for the for traffic reason and for um, safety uh, reason. I don't want to uh, to talk anymore <laughs> about uh, the UTM and the ZCS because they are uh, well explained in uh, in the in the previous uh, uh, presentations. And uh, what we can do, uh, what we can say is that in La Spezia, the, the, the flights were carried out by the external company, uh, an Italian company, in order to fasten the, also the activities. 
and the DTM uh, and the, the 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 UTM well was connected also to the these systems uh, owned by the the external uh, company that uh, carried out the activities in La Spezia. So uh, the demonstration is that the labyrinth uh, work can be also ex extended to other uh, actors out of the project. Uh, the area, uh, while the, during the, for the operational conditions, we reduce a little bit the areas for the, for the inspection. It was in the, in the, in the square in, uh, in a rectangle in, uh, in red, uh, and was, uh, two days of, uh, of, uh, test. Um, uh, in, as uh, we said before, the the, the mean was a multi rotor, a drone multi rotor, uh, with less than ten ki kilos. Some photos of the of the <laughs> the the event. Uh, we uh, we we tested. Uh, the operator can. Uh, uh, was able were able to um, uh, to run along uh, specified uh, paths uh, identified uh, before the the test and they uh, verified the integration between the UTM and GCS to their uh, system and uh, with the with the operator we we have also a lot of recordings about our flights in order to eva and we evaluate some uh, the, the the use cases that I listed before, in particular also with cameras, also other things that uh, we are uh, interesting for the moment, like uh, the temperature of the of the all the means of transport uh, in the in the in the port or uh, uh, the the levels of uh, uh, quality of uh, infrastructure and so. So the results. For us, it was uh, the first time applying the drones in the Port Authority and as a Port Authority, uh, thanks to this experience, uh, we, we started for a new uh, industrial project uh, using drones. So for us, uh, we have no knowledge about it. We, have a, we had, a, during the project, a, a long process that was on operative and also on the regulation side because as I listed before, La Spezia is a particular area, is not, uh, has many restrictions, and uh, we had also a, a, a legal process uh, with uh, the other uh, public authorities, uh, the military navy, the, the Coast Guard, in order to obtain all the, all the permissions. So all, all, also on this side. In the meanwhile, the, the, as, as Anna knows, the, the regulation is changed two or three times uh, in Italy, uh, so uh, also this this thing is important. Uh, what about the technical experience is that uh, the Port Authority uh, has understood the importance of drones for port safety uh, reasons, in order to evaluate, to, uh, to control uh, the, their property without interferences with the operation side. And also, we we are aware of the fact that the UTM platform and the tools created by the project are uh, open, uh, and they can be used also by. But we we, are, we were the first one to experiment a, a sort of uh, um, this this kind of platform, uh, not uh, in in the in the in technical side. So. We are uh, the, so it is possible to open the, this experience also to other actors, and we will uh, go forward uh, looking for new experiences in the in the part of La Spezia, not only because the port authority has also other domains in other in other ports near La Spezia. Thank you. If you have, of course, if you have uh, some questions, you can ask me. Good afternoon. My name is Angel Ayuso. I'm a project manager of Archimea, formerly known Space. Archimea is a technology company that operates globally, providing innovation, 
solution and product in highlight demanding sector. Our sector of activity are aerospace, defense, business, biotechnology, and fintech. For our use cases, we use our, our sector by those features and practically. The safety features are autopilot Archimea, fail safe, ADS transponder, front and lateral cameras, no fly zones, emerging modes, and communication. Also, her weight, speed, and range of maneuver. Now we are going to watch a video where can see the capabilities the safer with the birds. Due to the complexity and relativity required to operate in critical infrastructure, Archimea saw the necessity to create an autopilot environment in order to provide tailoring functionalities to improve safety, such as uh, manage our traffic, automatically avoid forbidden areas, or swan control. Having the full control of this technology allowed with Archimea to integrate our system completely in the labyrinth environment. The most important characteristic of the autopilot pilot Archimea is the control of software for emergency situations. Oh, sorry. Uh, is the control software for emergency situations like GPS loss, com loss, or low battery that has an autopilot response. Our use case was in airport environment where are several problems that hinder the perfect function of air traffic. Two of the main problems are avian control to avoid the bird streaks, surveillance and detection of foreign objects. In the, avian, in the avian control case, we prepare a flight plan will consist in a low pass of the UAV along waypoints one and two, where the presence of birds has been detected. In the airport survival and food case, the UAV will fly over the perimeter of the airport, searching for potential dangerous intrusion or, or objects. The UAV will transit the video feed in the real time to the operator. <coughs> the final tests were performed at the airfield of Marwan in Segovia. It included a fly, flying Zephyr UAV, like initial Lewis case plan, and three simulated UAVs sharing the same airplane. This flight plan, I like a real situation. In the photo on the left, we can see the airport surveillance flight plan and the photo on the right, the avian control flight plan. Once we have the flight plans, we start the test with following steps. Connect, connecting to Interface Manager Startup, logging at UTM, check that there is in previous data from another session, I log the flight plans one by one with each UIB, accept the suggest flight plan. Verify that there are no dangerous crossing or approaches. Pass the checklist to each UAV and start taking off the real platform. When the altitude is stabilizing, we go into flight plan mode. Position reports are sent to the UTM. If the UAV straight considerably, UTM creates a safety zone around it. In this way, we avoid the collision between UAV. Now, we're going to watch a short video with the test. Here we can see a safer camera with the speed and the height. And under in the right, uh, the other UAVs. That is uh, that view. We can see that all the UAVs are working together and there is a conflict between us. Okay. For the conclusion, both of the tests were performing successfully, signed all the flight plans, uploaded to the UTM, were modified, 
and sent to Archimedes Ground Control Station successfully. Avoid collision between interfering air traffic. Some areas to improvements detected are the lighting and uploading flight plans to make a small correction in trajectory or time could create conflicts. And the conflict techniques, which take into account the flight mechanics of fixed winds, aerial platform, or high priority traffic such as large. Low maneuverability UAVs could be interesting for future developments. And now we're going to a uh, uh, watch a video with all the making of and all the work of the test. I think it's prepared. And um, thank you very much. <laughs> validate new swarm drone applications through research and development of 4D swarm drone trajectory planning algorithms for implementation in ground control stations and new use-based services supporting swarm drone self-guidance to improve safety, efficiency and sustainability in civil transport. We are uh, through team partners from companies, uh, different research organisms and, and users. And in this project, what we are, are uh, is oriented to uh, the safe uh, management of a set of drones, up to uh, a swarm of 10 of them, uh, in order that an operator can manage in a restricted area, a port or a station, um, in case of emergency in cities, in, in order to provide to uh, all of these UAVs with a uh, completed path in order that they can fly uh, safely. Labyrinth aims to provide a solution to the new framework designed by CESAR, called U-Space, to safely and efficiently integrate drone operations at low level, below 120 meters in European airspace. U-Space is a recent definition of how the traffic of drones will be managed in Europe. For several reasons, this traffic cannot be done by controllers and has to be automated. Uh, and it can be seen like a coordination of services. In the Labyrinth project, we are implementing some of these services, some of the most key services, and we are testing them in real life in these cases. This implementation and uh, test of the services will allow us to detect weaknesses and gaps in the space columns and suggest improvements uh, to its definition. Given this scenario, Labyrinth proposes the need to investigate new centralized planning systems capable of communicating with all drones in a given area, processing their desired origin and destination points, and calculating trajectories to avoid collisions. This project is a, is a, has three main aspects from the technical point of view. One of them is the 4D path planning for obtaining the conflicted path planning, the conflicted temporary and especially. The use of 5D communication to maintain a continuous communication of, uh, with all of UAVs independently of the distance uh, of, the, of the drone to the operator. We don't need to maintain a, a visual line with the, or a radio link, a direct radio link, because we use the 5G communication. And also, uh, we have another strong uh, part that is the, uh, how to maintain the cybersecurity of the whole system. The above technologies must be integrated into a use space system that is capable of managing multiple UAVs in a single airspace. Therefore, these technologies are connected to the ground control station, which controls the scheduled flights at all times. Dentro de lo que son las distintas funcionalidades que se van a desarrollar dentro del entorno de las necesidades de use space, de los que vamos a proporcionar el INTA para el programa Labyrinth. Lo que ha hecho es eh, utilizar las estaciones de control en tierra de los drones que normalmente ya utiliza el, el, el INTA y adaptarlos a las necesidades de comunicación para dar los servicios que U-Space requiere. Y nosotros lo que hemos hecho, por un lado, es modificar el software de la estación para dar esas funcionalidades y a la vez modificar el comportamiento de los drones comerciales, como son drones de JI, para que también modificando su software, su comportamiento con las funcionalidades que el te proporciona, poder también dar esas necesidades o eso servir, dar información a, a U-Space para que todo, todo este escenario pueda en, tomar un engranaje 
perfecto en una operación multidrón con distintos tipos de reactores. Labyrinth will lead to applications in roads, airports, seaports, and emergency situations related to urban mass concentration scenarios. For this purpose, the developed technology has been tested in four different use cases. Today we'll be performing the test on the use case scenario for um, airport control. Um, on the mission that we will perform today, we will use the Sephiroth UAV, which is a UAV shaped like a, like a, like a bird of prey. And we will be using for a mission for aviary control. So we keep the, we keep the airfield protected of, uh, of potentially dangerous uh, bird strikes. On our second flight, we'll be performing a, a patrol mission, uh, taking care of the security of the, the air, airport. On today's mission, we'll be performing a flight with uh, one UAV combined with uh, two simulated UAVs. Uh, three, these three units will be reporting the information to the UTM and we'll, we'll be negotiating uh, their trajectories in order to avoid collision. The maritime transport, uh, two ports show, show interest in using drone for the daily tasks. Uh, in the case of the port of La Spezia in Italy, that is a container port, uh, it was their first uh, contact with using drones for monitoring the loading operations or for their daily security and safety routines. For instance, they could check that uh, even when the drones need to fly very high over the cranes in the port, uh, the quality of the images that they could uh, see it was fit perfectly with the images. And in the case of the port of Ferrol in Spain, uh, they, they, they need the drones to monitor the traffic in the river and to inspect the infrastructure, so, uh, also to deliver packages to the, to the ships, and also to uh, broadcast instructions to the captains of the ships. We are testing two different uh, scenarios today. The first one is a cardiac arrest in the context of a car accident. And we will have three drones working on the scenario. Two of them will be our eyes uh, in the sky uh, with cameras uh, assessing the entire scene. And, the, and there's a third uh, drone delivering a uh, defibrillator. So a lady rescuer who is present uh, at the scene will use it to help the victim. The second use case it's a mass gathering situation in Madrid at the Santiago Bernabeu Stadium and the drones will help us guide the, the crowd in an evacuation situation using predetermined routes. We will use the drones with loudspeakers and color-coded lights to guide the people to the path we need them to be. We are trying to use the capabilities of the solar technology to identify vehicles with uh, speed, uh, special speed, over speed uh, in the lanes. We are also trying to identify distances in between cars and cyclists, for example, uh, to, to being able to, to focus on these distances, which uh, uh, is the main cause of uh, cyclist accidents and deaths. Um, we are also going to try to identify um, special uh, or reckless driving uh, in, uh, in the lanes. Uh, with this system, we are able to identify fluxes on the lanes and on the roads, uh, and we can manage somehow the, uh, the traffic fluxes in the roads. Uh, we can also send information to the drivers, preventing them from future events. Uh, closed lanes uh, and this kind of special situations. We can also manage having this information from, from the drones. Um, special operations in the road, for example, that we are not able to, to do it right now with this flexibility that the drones can give us. These potential applications are not currently covered by existing legislation. For this reason, Labyrinth is working to propose regulatory solutions to enable the full development of drone technology to ensure that all potential applications developed can become commercial solutions in the EU space in the future. We have applied to different approaches when it comes to the review of the regulation. 
Uh, one of them is the top-down approach, where we have um, worked on, at European level. Uh, we have worked on regulation more related to the, to the EU space. Um, we have worked closely with Eurocontrol, that is one of the partners in the project as well. And the second approach was uh, bottom-up, that it means identifying the different use cases in the project. We have analyzed what would be the restrictions that would limit uh, this technology to be applied in the different safety scenarios. Well, our next speaker are going to present uh, the part uh, uh, relative to policies and the standardization. Uh, Ana Gomez Arce first, and then Joseph Saurer from the Ana. Um. I know it's not the most interesting subject of the project <laughs> and it's after lunch time so I wouldn't try to make it as easy as possible because as you know this work package is mainly reading and understanding and writing a lot so um, um, I will try to make it uh, as easy as possible. The objective of this uh, work package uh, is what you can see there. I mean it's uh, you know very good that when you work with these uh, R&D projects, what you want to do is to commercialize them at the end of the life cycle of the R&D uh, project. And to be able to, not to commercialize, but they can be entered into a real operation. That's, I think, what you, what you work for. And sometimes what we find is that the regulation limits uh, our imagination uh, on our developments when it comes to, to, to prove this kind of technology. So, so our idea was to work on this, maybe mainly because at the end we want to propose uh, measurements and regulations and some uh, uh, standardization also aspects uh, for, for you uh, to see that this project has a future implementation and real implementation. Um, we also were very much aware that some of the concepts we are developing in the project are completely new. We were discussing with you uh, several times. And, and uh, what, what, what we think is that if something is not regulated, it doesn't exist. Okay. So if we are proposing a new project, what we would like to do is to offer proposals on the regulation so that at the end this technology is recognized and integrated into the system so we can use this technology for several applications and uses as we have discussed during the whole day. Um, we have reviewed not only European uh, regulation at high level with, uh, well, you will see it later, but we also try to deal with all the secondary aspects that could somehow limit uh, the project or limit the full application in a TRL that, that could be much higher than the one we are uh, defining in the project. So we have also dealt with privacy rights and personal data protection issues and remind you that we were the data protection officer also in the project. Um, also analyze and see how the different law enforcement agencies uh, were defined because new concepts require new responsibilities. So at the end, we have to identify somehow where are we going to put all these responsibilities and who has to decide what. Um, we have also analyzed metrology and certification, and this goes pretty much in the line of the payload, as you already know, um, not, not only for the drone itself, that of course it has to be uh, certified, but also we were focusing pretty much on uh, the payload applied to the different use cases. And also liability and insurance requirements definition. Um, we have uh, worked very closely together with Joseph that he will, uh, he will talk later, so we did an overlap somehow in, in the work we were doing. Um, Eurocontrol has worked also uh, very much together with us. As you know, uh, they have a, quite a big view and experience on this aspect. And um, uh, also we have re uh, reviewed several legal acts that affect somehow uh, the effect of the regulation on the project. 
we have been working also very much together, we can say it somehow, with, uh, with EASA. We contacted them in the middle of the project, discussing with them and pre presenting what was the project about. Uh, good news is that they were extremely interested in the results of the project. They know uh, the capability and potential the project has. And uh, I guess at the end of the project, Luis, we will have to go there and tell them the final results. <laughs> uh, so how we did it? Uh, we did it, as I explained in the video. First of all, we made a regulation compilation and analysis on what, what is the state of the art as well in terms of regulation. We then do the bottom-up approach, as I said, is to identify in the case study what is the, the regulation affecting for the specific use cases. And all together analyzed, we have prepared finally the, the regulation recommendations. So here you have uh, uh, the, uh, the deliverables, how we did it. We did for the first part of the analysis a uh, regulation matrix because we thought it was much more interesting for you and easier to work with. Um, we have integrated in the, uh, in the uh, matrix all the information that it was needed basically for the, for the operation of the use cases uh, within the Labyrinth project, um, making at the end like a general analysis at the beginning. Uh, when we worked in the second part of the project on, on, uh, on the bottom-up approach, um, I know none of you have read the documents, but I think it's very interesting that you do <laughs> because you will have a lot of uh, useful information. We did a, a case study regulation analysis that I will show you later. And um, we also identified together with Zero Control what we call the best practices. So there are, we, the, the, we are not alone in this work. There are different countries that had faced these problems uh, earlier and before that we did. And you will see it later, that they have identified, not modifying their own regulation, national regulation, but also identified good practices that could put, pay, could be play, put into place uh, when it comes to the development of this kind of technology. Um, and then we... Uh, we will I will be presenting to you in a very high level what are the main conclusions. Okay, so in the top-down approach, as I was telling you, we had into account all the regulation. I'm not going to read because you all know very well about this. Um, we also included also the uh, new uh, European Commission rules, EU rules, um, established into the dedicated space, uh, airspace for drones, okay, as the use space, that it will become applicable this month of April for you to know, but I guess you already know. We have also worked on this regulation that it's boring, so I, uh, <laughs> I guess for you, so I will pass fast. Um, and other regulation and decisions that are important and have to be taken into account with, when developing this kind of, uh, of exercises. Here you have an example, well, we have a picture on how the uh, matrix looks like with this structure that we worked to make this information organized and easier for, for, um, for a review. Um, we also looked very much into detail when it comes to national Spanish regulation and Italian regulation as those two cases were developed in these, those countries. And we also compared the regulations to see how one can influence in the other when proposed the solutions. Um, we also identify, and I think it's good for you to know, I don't, and I invite you to read these documents we prepare because I think they are quite interesting and you can have some ideas on how to work on this. Um, use space initiatives that we think are important for this project and show somehow some kind of innovation or openness, I would say, in this kind of, uh, of uses. So that would be Italy, UK, USA, New Zealand, Switzerland, and Germany. You have a deep analysis on these, uh, on these best practices on, on the different documents. Um, and how we did the bottom-up approach? Uh, we identified together with all the end users what would be the limitations they have, they found. Uh, in the moment of the trials, uh, not, not to be able to perform it in the future. And this is what we have identified together with them. And we, what we did is that we transformed this 
in after the trials, in concrete actions and concrete definitions, we have to work uh, to 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 achieve our goals in the work package. So when when we talk about the um, regulation and we are dealing with with engineers like you. Um, Sometimes you always try to to adjust your developments to what it is uh, mandatory to do or the procedures that are mandatory to do, forgetting sometimes that we are doing R&D. Uh, so what we propose is to to eliminate those barriers that we have and try to think from, from the beginning of the project, what is the concept we want to develop, okay? So taking into account these uh, different use cases, the use of airspace and all the common um, common aspects that could affect to all of them, we have prepared the recommendations. So what we have tried here to explain is, uh, again, let's forget what the regulation says now. Let's think, and we have this experience working in other in other areas, what is what I want to achieve? What is the concept I want to develop? And how this is gonna be, how this has to be constructed from the regulation point of view. So discussing pretty much uh, with, with some of you on how, on how to orient this, we have to come from the regulatory point of view, let's not forget this, on the definition on a new concept provided by the labyrinth, that is this drone cluster, is the GCS, uh, the, um, uh, the control station, and the UDM, okay? So with these concepts, we have identified here what are the uh, aspects we have to modify completely with this new view. Definitely, we have to define what is an operation now. What, what do we consider as an operation when it comes to this platform? Uh, we have given in the document, I don't want to go much into detail, but you have it, uh, you have it public in, the, uh, in, the, um, uh, in, the, in our storage. <laughs> um, how we define an operation for us is one of the most important things to see because what is the use of this operation? It will determine all the different aspects that nowadays are very binded by, by the regulation. Um, what is the flying mode? What is the route planning? I mean, these are aspects that we have to define. Um, we are not going to give like a uh, very close definition so we can, uh, we can be, let, let's say, flexible because we are proposing uh, complex situation and complex environments when sometimes we work autonomously, sometimes not. Uh, we have some uh, fixed routes, sometimes we have to modify them because it will enter into some conflict with, with, with other situations that are flying around us. Um, we have also worked in determining the number of drones that could be considered in this drone cluster more, more than a drone swarm that may, may limit us a little bit more. Um, we have also identified a lot of administrative burden that has to be performed always before a trial or before an operation. And in terms of this, to make it a little bit more flexible, that I think it's, it's one of the good things if we can define uh, these aspects. Um, how to define the limit with restricted areas in airspace. Okay, uh, it also, and I go back again to this drone cluster, how they operate and defining pretty well how is this, this operation. Um, we also have to define, and we have defined in this case, what is the pilot role that is not gonna be the pilot role as it is right now, uh, thinking in the future on, on how the operator will work, how the, uh, the UDM and GCS will, will work and combine the, the, the decisions that maybe now uh, the pilot can take. And this is a little bit what we have worked in the, uh, in, the, in the project. We have also worked, and this is out of the, of the, um, of the square, because it has to do more with uh, what Joseph will tell you later on, and also uh, with the specificity of the different use cases that it has to do with the payload, the distance and time, and the visual line of sight. And this is the second conclusion and recommendation we have. I mean, we have to approach r and in two, in two views. One, the direct view appointing the commercialization or, or 
uh, eliminating the limitations that the project will have in, the, in, in order to operate and then to have a longer view. And in a longer view, we propose a regulatory sandbox specifically for drones. If, if you don't know what it is, I, I explain you very simple. It's a control environment framework, okay, where, where um, the regulatory authorities facilitate somehow testings and facilitate innovative developments, like is the case of this, of this project. Um, we have proposed it because we have seen that in other areas, for example, and in, in artificial intelligence, uh, it al already has to be set it, it, it has to be set it already uh, by the European Commission. Uh, it's working pretty well. Also in Spain, I don't know if you know, but we are working in the, in the uh, fintech uh, aspect. We also have a regulatory sandbox. We are working in Pons as well uh, in this kind of, of projects and sandboxes at, at national level. And we think it would be very interesting also to, to, to elevate it at the European level. And I think we can make uh, our lobby from the project to the European Commission to propose and open a little bit this, uh, this field. No? I think it's a good idea, or we think in the project it's also a good idea because it's quite aligned with the Easy Drone Strategy 2.0 that uh, I guess you all know delivered by the European Commission recently. When, uh, I mean, if, if authorities want us to make uh, um, research, they have to offer also these spaces where, where they can be proven and no limits in regulation are defined so we can do whatever we think and prove the concepts we want to prove. Um, it's also interesting because it promotes innovation and is the case of Labyrinth. So it encourages, uh, it encourages the development of new ideas, new technologies. We can continue also promoting this kind of projects with different applications based on the same uh, technological concepts. Um, also, it's implemented in different EU states. I already told you the example in Spain and the proper uh, European Commission setting the one in the, uh, artificial intelligence, but there are 21 EU member states that they already work uh, with the regulatory sandboxes. And it's also because we learn by doing. I mean, it's a system in regulation where it's very fixed and it's very uh, tight that they don't allow us to do many things that we may like to do. Um, we learn by doing together with them. They see the benefits of, of these kind of approaches and, um, and at the end we, we are able to, to advance in this sense. Uh, for those of you who doesn't know how a regulatory sandbox uh, work, it's described also in the documents, but I can explain to you it's a kind of procurement activity. I mean, uh, all the projects, they uh, present their proposals to the public authorities. The public authorities, they approve uh, these kind of projects to evaluate, and they know already that, that they have to be using some flexibility in these regulator regulatory aspects, and they are willing to work like this. You, if you get the grant to participate in the sandbox, uh, you, you do your trials and with the conclusions they are going to be implemented directly in the regulations and they directly will deal uh, with the different authorities to, to, to permit this flexibility into the regulation. So um, I know it's not much fun as the technical part, <laughs> but it is also very, very important for, for, for the development of the project to, to be in the future a, a, a real solution in the market. And that's all for my part. <laughs> okay, then uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Joseph Saurer. I'm from uh, DIN. DIN is the German uh, Standardization Institute. And uh, together with colleagues from INTA and Eurocontrol, um, we worked on the Bog Package 8 standardization and certification. And uh, we, we decided to split our presentation into parts. I will give you a very short introduction about uh, the objectives and the tasks and the deliverables. Um, and uh, afterwards, my colleague Reime uh, from Inter will give you an uh, overview about, a detailed overview about uh, the the last two deliverables, safety analysis and uh, acceptable means of compliance.
Okay, uh, just to just to recall, what are the the objectives of the standardization work package? Uh, the aim was to con contribute to bridging potential gaps uh, between existing standards in the field of unmanned aircraft systems, especially in terms of uh, air traffic management, uh, through improved interoperability. As you know, um, even that in case that the the UAS uh, topic is still new, but uh, a lot of organizations uh, spend a lot of efforts on working uh, in, in the standardization field, uh, um, starting on international level, but also here in Europe uh, or in, uh, in the US or in, in Asia. And um, yeah, another um, objective was to assess the project's results and uh, to analyze them for potentials to be transformed into standardization and certification activities and um, to, to, to have a look uh, what are the labyrinth, labyrinth uh, contribution could be uh, to, to give a recommendation into the work of the um, ongoing standardization activities. So um, another thing was to disseminate the, our knowledge about existing uh, standardization and certification activity amongst the labyrinth partners. Uh, as you may recall, we have been reached out to you many times uh, for, for um, asking you on the other side for giving us input, but also um, from our side to inform you about uh, existing standardization and certification documents. Okay, this is an overview about our task. We had uh, three tasks to do. First was the analysis of existing standards and uh, certification activities. Task number one was the identification of standardization potential and the development of a standardization and certification strategy. And task uh, 8.3 was standardization and certification activities. In the first project phase, we uh, spent a, a lot of efforts on de uh, developing our first deliverable, an overview of existing standards and standardization um, um, and certification activities. Um, we gave an explanation of uh, yeah, some standardization and certification fundamentals, the standardization landscape and important stakeholders uh, with an overview about relevant organizations and players in the field of uh, UAS and um, UAS uh, um, UTM activities. And uh, at the end of the, our uh, deliverable 8.1 was a very detailed overview about a list uh, of existing standards and um, yeah, very important certification um, documents which should be into uh, account for for the activities in this labyrinth field and um, yeah afterwards uh, we worked on the deliverable 8.2 standardization and certification strategy as you may recall we have uh, reached out to you uh, with two surveys about the uh, labyrinth technical work packages to um, identify gaps and standardization potential and uh, yeah we received um, a lot of input from you. So once again, many thanks, uh, many thanks to you, to all of you who contributed there. And uh, yeah, the conclusion was that we focus our uh, standardization criteria, as for example, especially on communications, navigation, safety issues, and uh, general aspects like um, like uh, vocabulary or terms and definitions or and, uh, categorization, some of the um, yeah, basic fundamentals. Okay, now um, I've, I'm coming to the end of, the, of my part of the uh, overview. Um, at the moment, we are working on 8.3 standardization and certification activities and uh, we are planning as uh, Anna has said uh, we are planning a, a common meeting together with uh, work package 9 uh, to disseminate um, the, the results of our analysis and uh, having um, a little bit more time to to focus on the issues on the on the regulatory aspects and uh, the certification and standardization potential 
and uh, this meeting is planned for um, yeah around the 8th of June. Um, we are at the moment uh, th this uh, meeting is under preparation, but hopefully end of next week we can uh, we can uh, send you the invitation for this event. And uh, yeah, so that's all from my side. And now I would hand it over to my colleague uh, Jaime for uh, giving you an overview about uh, achieved results on 8.4 safety analysis for new features as required by swarm operations and 8.5 airworthiness requirements and uh, acceptable means of compliance. Uh, hello, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to talk about a very difficult uh, work package. This has been very difficult from the beginning. Why? Because uh, certification activities, certification um, standardization of something that is really new and that nothing was written about no, at the beginning. So we had a hard time to figure out on, on focusing the, the, the initiative. But now that is uh, the last of the last part of the project, I think that, that is a good idea to look back and, and think about on all, all the stuff we have gone through. <clears throat> okay. And from the very beginning of the project, we had three goals. Hmm? The first goal was to control multiple UIDs from our ground control station that has been a working ground control station UAV, one, one. Mm -hmm. We wanted to do it bigger. We wanted to control many UAVs, and we wanted also to have uh, several ground control stations. Mm -hmm. So this was one of the, our goals, to have multiple UAVs operation controlled from a single post on the ground control. The second thing was to implement the development that was going to be made in the project for 4G and 5G technologies in order to communicate between ground control station and uh, UAVs. Mm? But not only uh, with UTM, but also ground control station, UTM, UAV ground control station. That means command and control of the UAV and also receiving the images sent by the, the payloads or whatever the payload was. Mm? And the third uh, uh, goal that we had in the, in the development was the implementation on the ground control station on the use space functions and services that were developed hmm, by, uh, by uh, Carlos III and also by DRL hmm, as uh, the service of, of uh, multiple uh, mission and separation of the missions and also all the uh, functions that uh, were provided by use space. Hmm. Those were all goals, and we have got it. Mm -hmm. For instance, you can, you can see here, we have here our control post where you can select the UAV. Mm -hmm. Or say, I'm going to send to UAV number two, to UAV number five, whatever. Mm -hmm. And also receiving the telemetry. We can select where the telemetry is, and it's put there. Mm -hmm. We also modified the UAVs, we, as it, was, it has been said in, this, in, this, uh, uh, in the previous uh, conferences, we were using DJI uh, uh, drones, but we put add-ons, meaning that we were going to be able to use commercial of the self uh, drones, but putting exactly the needed thing to work as a multiple UAV operation. Uh, we did that. And we also put the developments made by Carlos III in order to communicate with the ground control station using the 4G, 5Gs. Thus, we have done. And <clears throat> in order to implement the uh, air traffic control on the ground control station, we did it in an, in an easy way. For instance, putting the DRL uh, web app, which is, okay, direct control with them, no interface, only present the information, present the services, and send them. But we also made a development here, and here, 
group is here, <laughs> the developers. We were using the ground control station, our ground control station, in order to easy the interface of the pilot so that he can receive the information from the uh, uh, UTM and send it right away to the to the to the drone, which is was quite a development. Mm -hmm. So for uh, we were lucky, or maybe we were unlucky, because we are in the middle. We were in the middle of all the all the things. We were developers. We were receiving information. We were receiving technology from Carlos III and from all all the people that were in the in the pro in the process in the project. We integrated things. We put it in the system, and we also had to deal with the with the final user. So we were in the in the middle of the of the of the of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So. It was, as I say, a luck and a unlucky situation. Lucky and unlucky situation. Okay, as I said, we modified commercial of the self drones, hmm? putting exactly the, the components and functions needed in order to receive 4G, 5G, and UTM services. We made developments on the ground control station. 4G, 5G, to command and control the UAVs, and also to communicate with a UTM. We also were able to provide the multiple UAV and making some payloads, uh, putting payloads on the system, for instance, camera, defibrillator in order to transport it. And also, um, it was megaphones, and it could have been, but we were not on time, uh, a leader in order to see uh, Volumes in the in the in the port of La Especia. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have done. We have been doing the operations in the Rozas Aerodrome. Two of the use cases: the use case with the emergency and the use case of a, a, of a traffic control, were uh, performed by us with the end user and with the developers together. Mm -hmm. We also have to get the flight clearance. And we were also involved in the certification and standardization, which uh, it gave us a nice picture of everything that was going to be developed. Mm -hmm. This has been explained by uh, Joseph, and I will explain a little bit those two last uh, deliverables. So uh, if we want to have the permission, we have to comply with the regulations already with it, it has been talked here. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that is needed in such an operation, like uh, the ones that we have been performing, is to have a safety analysis. That's the only requirement. You have to have a safety analysis. And the reference for safety analysis is the SORA method methodology. Okay, they say, okay, you have to give a CONOPS you have to determine the ground risk of your operation. You have to determine the air risk of uh, the flight where you are flying. And also uh, uh, give some safety objectives identification. But this methodology was made before the use space concept was developed. So it's not enough. Mm -hmm. OK, you saved your operations. But if you are, having, uh, you are receiving information and services from a UTM, there is a new scenario on all this. There is also a methodology that says, OK, if you are using space service, uh, you have to, to follow a few steps there. Hmm? Because, OK, maybe uh, the operation is safe, but I can make it safer because I can make it, uh, I can use, I can make use I can make use of the of the information provided by you EU space. Mm -hmm. For instance, the first thing that you have to do is to evaluate the ground risk. This is a, a, a the SORA process is a process very long. It takes weeks to, to perform, send, then it is a review that is sent back and you get the permission to fly. But that's not uh, applicable to an emergency situation with with drones, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. You have to have right away the, your plan, send it, and, and check it. So if we have a ground control station, or the operator has a ground control station, or a post, he can determine the volume, the airspace volume that he's going to be used, 
or C, and make the uh, the flights. For instance, I'm going to fly this. In, if you are going to fly this, and you have a, a map with a population, you can check and you can verify that you are not going to be able to to create a, a dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. But you have to have very well defined flight path and nice uh, on, and uh, um, quite accurate uh, population density maps. Mm -hmm. That's what we have been using. For instance, you have this precision. This is the uh, population. It's uh, OK, there's uh, 300 people in this area. So you have the density. And you can check with your uh, flight path if you are going to create a problem or not. Eh? You, of course, you have to you have to have the nominal flight path. You have to have uh, the areas of operation. It has been very useful in the in the project. Not always given a flight path. Maybe you are going to be using a portion of this air volume, fl major fly there, and forget. I'm not I'm not going to give the UTM a completely 4D plan. I'm going to be use this. Please, I want to segregate from the rest of the of the of the of the drones. I want to segregate this, and I'm not going to get out of this. Eh? So, and I can do whatever I do, whatever I like in this area. Hmm? That has been a very nice solution in the in the use cases because it's okay. I go there. Forget about me. I will call you again when I want to get out of this uh, volume of work. This small volume of work. For instance, in the speed control, it was great. So, uh, with this, and if we control the area where we are going to operate it, and we know exactly uh, the flight path that we are going to follow, we are able to guess if we are going to be able to operate in, in, a, in a particular uh, uh, place. Mm -hmm. Another thing is uh, you have to take care of, of the vegetation or the buildings and so on. So there are some models that you can implement embed on your on your on your ground control session which will provide you the capability to uh, fly uh, to plan something and check if you are safe enough and then you can fly. That's going to be a that must be a, a, the solution, not the this process of, OK, I'm going to make a safety analysis. I'm going to send it. And then when I will receive back, uh, I don't know, three three weeks, I will fly. No. Something must be the future is in around this uh, uh, implement uh, to embed this functionality on the, on the, on the operator's uh, ground control station. Same thing with the air risk uh, ev uh, evaluation. Uh, there is a, a night uh, drones, uh, um, an app that you can use, and you can, uh, if you are using use space, you can exactly know what is uh, what are you affecting. Mm? So that is going to give you the the information. For instance, if there are restricted or dangerous areas, advices of coordination with other aerodromes and protected natural areas. Uh, for instance, here in this uh, particular use case of the Puerto del Ferrol that we were uh, affecting some uh, protected areas. Mm? But uh, even though you have this, mm, you never can avoid that uh, a visual flight rules a, a plane goes there and, and, and impact you. So the only solution right now is to segregate the use space. And is what we have been doing that. Mm? OK. We segregate by Notan, and uh, whenever, uh, if if a man uh, traffic uh, uh, check uh, on man traffic checks the this tool, it will say that we are operating there, and so it's segregated. And if a man uh, traffic uh, enters the insignia in aire, for instance, the tool that we use there, so the restrictions, uh, uh, the, the space is segregated, so we can we can perform a flight. Uh, without any danger, but we have to segregate it. Other thing is that when use, uh, when a U space is uh, defined and put it here, everybody will know, And uh, but so far, no. It, it, this uh, use space creation, as the director of the aviation, uh, civil aviation here said, it has never happened here in, uh, in Spain. Mm? So the only possibility now is to, to segregate. 
Okay, so this is the risk analysis that we have been performing so far. But in this risk analysis, this UTM is now um, under development, it's under test. So, uh, okay, I cannot say, hey, mitigation measure, I'm going to be using something that is under test. They will say no. Say no, no. If it's under test, it's going to fail. What are you going to do then with this? Hmm? So, this has been performed so far, and the next step is, okay, we are going to not saying, okay, this is going to fail. The, for instance, the tracking service is going to fail, so I have to do this and this and this. No. Put a um, requirement and on reliability of this service, and this is the next step. Hmm? What we're going to do on, and on the, last, the last deliverable. So we are going to start using the uh, use space services as mitigation measures, which has, has, we haven't done it because it was under test. But now we're going to, be, uh, to go a little uh, further, and we are going to uh, start putting some requirements, some recommendations on how those use space functions must uh, perform hmm? in reliability and also in accuracy and so on. With this, I think that I'm almost done hmm? because uh, delivery uh, 8.4, which is what we already have and have been using in the in the use cases, in the last use cases that we have been talking about, uh, is assumed that all the use space services are going to fail. But now, in, in, in this last deliverable, we will see uh, the level of integrity and reliability or unreliability of the use space services. Uh, and how to make, uh, to make the risk acceptable. Huh? And that will be the final contribution of our work package. Uh, thank you for your attention. And, and if you have any questions, uh, I'm ready. Well, we have the, the last part of this uh, initial part of the, of the meeting today, which is uh, the open discussion about the different topics we have talked, and also uh, some conclusion about what we have uh, uh, seen today. Uh, if uh, someone wants to open the discussion no, or I can try to, to open. For, for me, it has been very, very interesting, many of the different aspects. I... I think we have developed uh, by now a first, a first and a small operational UTM that uh, initially led us to obtain many, many different information that up to now was not clear on how is going to be the behavior. For instance, uh, which uh, number of the, the, the UAVs can fly over an area. Uh, we don't know, for instance, uh, how to integrate this by now with the normal traffic with the UTM because this will uh, introduce uh, contingencies because, for instance, in Madrid you have uh, flights of helicopters that probably are not uh, flying very high. And all these aspects need, need to be treated, need to be covered. And this is uh, perhaps the moment we can use this kind of a tool for, for, for testing, for analyzing, for studying these systems. It's my, my opinion. I don't know if any other of you has another different opinion about that. Another question is uh, the person from Samur uh, told that probably uh, we don't have today fast deployment drones because for emergency situation one thing which is important is the possibility of having a, a relatively fast uh, deployment drones. I think today most of the drones uh, need a time for the deployment that is uh, let's say medium, not, uh, not very fast. And then I don't know how to cover that. Probably the people that has more experience with, uh, uh, with drones can, can think about that. But uh, I, I don't know if it is possible to do it faster. If my, I'm not expert in, in drones properly. But today I think that this is a slow deployment of the drones. From the, the moment we get, we are right to the place at the moment that the drone is flying. I don't know the time, but it's, it's, it's not probably enough 
for every first response in, in somewhere. This is an interesting uh, aspect. I don't know if the experience of the INTA or any other drone operators about that. No, not unclear. The only thing is, I think, uh, to simplify the safety analysis, as I just said. Yeah, do you think in case if we simplify the, the analysis, this is possible uh, to... Yeah, okay. Well, probably it is a... Okay, I... Well, we have a reply. And for my part, I have not many, many more conclusions. I, I would like to... Uh, to remind you that the important for, for me has, has been very surprising the important that uh, the regulatory aspect and the norm and the standardization aspects uh, is going to to be in the future because at the beginning when we start the, the project we, we don't know which is which is the the safety time window we need to use in in the drones we don't know which is the safety uh, distance we need to maintain in, in the drones but not sure uh, at the beginning, it was very, very, very unsafe when we do the planning because many of this information was not standardized, was not in the, in the norms, and uh, and then I think it's important. But I have been very, very conscient of the importance of this aspect uh, along the the project. For me, it has, has been a very, very interesting surprise and um, very important. I think. I think I don't know if any other person has another uh, question about the uh, conclusions. Or, or not? No. Nothing. Oliver. Um, yeah, I, I'm thinking a bit out of, out of the of the deployment of the UTM. So maybe you, you can comment on this how it how it would look like. Probably you would need some some um, let's say international deployment, a central UTM, maybe operated by Eurocontrol. Um, in addition, you would maybe need national UTMs or local UTMs, and all these UTMs need to cooperate somehow. So, how would, would this maybe look like in the future? Yeah. How could this look like? Yeah, I think we we should, we should do well. We should go to do this kind of, uh, of thing. But for instance, for me, one thing which is interesting also too is the possibility of using. Uh, a service like a UTM with many different GCS from different uh, manufacturers, from different uh, companies. At the beginning, I have not uh, thought too much about that, but in the context of the project, it was very diff very interesting because uh, Inta has uh, some drones. In case of La Spezia, they have used another GCS from another manufacturer, and all of these need to to be integrated in a more open way than than now. And this is a process also. So it's going to to become in the next year, I, I think. No, I don't know. So you need standardized interfaces? Yeah. You need standardized interfaces. I don't understand. Ideally, standardized interfaces between the UTM and the GTS, GTS yeah. for example. I'm not sure to what extent this is part of, of Labyrinth, but probably some less than demand in the future. Or using protocols like Map MapLink, for example, that, that could be used for this. You know, there are many partners that can respond probably better than me to that to that questions. I don't know. Yeah, that's more of a space question, I think. I'll, I'll try to answer as as fast as we can. Um, for the ah uh -huh. okay. Um, for your first question was about your space and how to manage, how to standardize this communication and to make it viable for everything. Um, right now, there is no uh, central standard. We only have the concept of operations, the um, US space model. And the idea is to uh, free, uh, to give a more open system and allow uh, several agents to create their own US space services. Uh, so instead of having a centralized main blog that contains everything as is done right now, it will be more of um, a set of services that every that um, some private or public companies provide and then give information from one to each other. For example, if the planner might be interesting to instead of having just one system for tactical resolution, that there are several ones that they compete between each other and you can have a better resolution and decide which one you want 
or meteorological information instead of having a centralized way to get all the meteorological information that every country has its own. And for what I know right now, I, I cannot give you a perfect answer. Uh, they, they are still developing what's the best way to standardize the system. And when it comes to communications, um, sorry, I have no idea. I don't know, I don't think there's anything about operators in the sense of how they will communicate with the drones, as, such as using modeling or if it's going to be internal for each company. I cannot answer that, I'm sorry. But I, I, there's, there's, that's another line of study. I don't know. It's, it's kind of out of the scope <coughs> of the US space system, as the idea is just to give the, the UTM, to give an unmanned tracking management system that gives, the, that gives them basic information for then the operators to be able to freely fly or to fly with safety in the airspace that we have right now. So, does that answer no. question? A, a, problem, a problem related to what you have uh, asked. In the context of the project, is uh, how many po waypoints we provide to the to the drone? Because as, at planning time, we generate a lot of points, too much points for the for the drones today, and then uh, they they told us, oh, but this is too much. We only can provide the drone 10, 20, 50 points. Yeah, but then you decrease the quality of the path. And then uh, this uh, should be also at some moment standardized, because uh, because now it's very dependent on the on the on the manufacturers of the drone, I think. But ma ma many small aspects like that uh, need to be defined also. Well, the communication, which is the format and so on, but uh, many things like like that. For instance, uh, initially we 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 plan even swarms in tight formation. But the problem with type formation is uh, you cannot do the conflict properly because you need it uh, to be done at control level. At and control level means that all the drones need to be communicated drone to drone directly. And this is a very, very strong problem. I don't think this can be easily uh, normalized in, in some years, but it, it, it will be needed at any moment. There are many small things like that that need to be work more in the future, I think. More questions? No? Then I think we can have a coffee and talk a little more. <laughs> Thank you.